From the Dice Abide Live studios, it's Late Night War Games with your hosts, Adam and John. Hey, thank you, Jay, and uh, hello, everyone. I'm Adam, but you know me as the Dice Abide. I'm John, also known as uh, Foolish Ashigaru. <laughs> oh, no. That's begun. It's begun. Perfect, perfect second ITS name, which will... <laughs> yeah, I can't take credit. It's all 100% Tony. Uh, came up with it. We'll have to uh, talk in depth about it yes, uh, <laughs> a little bit later in the episode. But uh, tonight is just us, mm-hmm. you and me. Uh, the, well, the, a lot to talk original. about, though. Yes, we do. Tons. Um, well, uh, John, what are you drinking tonight? I am actually having this lovely uh, binary brewing uh, motherboard milk st- milk stout. It's a new Ooh. brewery that opened up uh, in you know in, in the suburbs of Portland. Uh, and they're like all computer themed. They have like t-shirts with like three and a half inch floppies on them, that kind of thing. Oh, uh, fun. And all of their, all of their beers are super nerdy. There's like a virtual redality, which is their red ale, right? Mm-hmm. There's motherboard milk stout. Um, I think there's a hack the planet, uh, IPA kind of thing. Uh, it was pretty fun. Awesome. And, their, and their food is all megabytes. No. Uh, uh-huh. uh-huh. So like, what if you just had smaller kilobytes, right? Like for appetizers. I mean, that's the kids' menu. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah, there you fine. go. Perfect. So, I mean, the the it, it hits all the things, right? Like terrible dad jokes and also uh, engineer in jokes. And I'm like, right. that's me. Do <laughs> they do they cater? Do they cater in terabytes? Yeah, right. <laughs> they should. I would. I would. I would run that far too long. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, to 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 cover like uh, the next RC go. Thing. we should just do a exabyte catering right there you go yeah they, they don't they don't do beer flights they do beer arrays <laughs> yeah yes exactly <laughs> just, just maybe yeah. maybe some hash tables in there terrible terrible <laughs> i love all of it yeah. well of so it. you're drinking from a uh, new brewery i'm drinking from an old brewery oh. uh, An- anchor brewing which is credited for being i didn't know this until until i found out that they were going that they were closing they're accredited being the first craft brewery in the United States, and they're my favorite beer. And I'm very sad that it's going away. Um, I heard about that. Yeah, it's so, a big bummer. Yeah, so I went to New Seasons and bought all of their inventory. <laughs> nice. There you go. There's just there's just two back cases. Of back of the truck. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So so well, I'll like be back enjoying. Up, back up the the mini shopping cart. Yeah, exactly. For at least a couple of weeks. All right, well, uh, cheers. 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 All right, well, let's uh, kick off that news. Yeah. So, click the right buttons. Did it. All right, so in the blogosphere, um, the Broman Academy mission for the quarter is breaking links, right? So pick your favorite non you know, I guess indirect, pick your favorite indirect, not non-indirect, pick your favorite indirect method of breaking links, right? So that means don't just like throw a tag at it or link to HMG, find some other sort of lateral play way of dealing with it. Uh, it could be an AD troop, be something like that, uh, uh, infiltrators running uh, a war band up, find find some other way of dealing with it. Maybe it's just you throw some Eclipse in front of them, right? And write in with your experience. That's sort of the deal. Um, Painting contest for the quarter is peripherals. So the intent of this was uh, from Nick, um, also known as Nix. Uh, he's uh, done a lot of X13 printing you may have seen on this channel. Um, but yeah, he was like, one of the things I, I don't see uh, very often is painted, you know, Palbots and that sort of stuff. He has his all these friends who play Infinity, uh, you know, his lovely painted armies, and then the poor Palbots and Yudbots and whatever, they get uh, kind of neglected off to the side. So. That's the prompt um, to sort of broaden the scope. I'm going to accept anything that's a peripheral, right? So antipodes are okay. Um, so like, you know, Batard, somebody asked me if Carmen and Batard, like Batard would be okay. I said, you know, sure. It's like to me a peripheral, any of like the- uh, Is it just the peripheral or the peripheral and the controller? Just the peripheral, right? Like if you mm-hmm. send a picture in with the controller just as an action shot, like totally fine, right? But we'll judge you on the peripheral alone. So uh, yeah, so just in general, right? As as feedback to people sending in photos, if you want to pose your stuff with other models, just to sort of give us the flavor, 
of the what your rest of your army looks like, please do so. Um, but remember, we're judging you on your paint job, not you know your army composition and all that stuff. So uh, mm -hmm. make sure that whatever you send us picture wise, we can actually see uh, and do a good job of evaluating your paint job. One of the things that uh, I'm thinking about doing in the future is sort of broadening, because you know we play other games besides Infinity. I'm thinking about broadening the uh, the prompt for painting beyond CB's model range, right? So even when War Crow comes out, uh, the the uh, the, the um, war game, right? Uh, obviously, we'll consider putting stuff uh, from there into the competition. But I uh, was thinking about you know including other model lines, 3D printed figures, um, that sort of thing. Not really sure how I'm going to structure that, but if you have opinions about it, feel free to chime in on the, the Dice of Vibe Discord. Um, hit me up, at me, and we'll sort of have a discussion about it. So and you can do a reference on size or quantity yeah. or so, just, or... so, not really sure what the plan is there. Still ruminating. I've got a whole, you know, half a quarter or whatever to figure it out, but probably won't start till next year, honestly. Uh, but yeah, so plenty of time to think about it and uh, ways to judge it and so on. So if you have, you have opinions or you want to be involved, let me know, and we'll we'll, uh, we'll get to it. But right. that's that's sort of sort of the thing in terms of uh, blog news. Um, of course, the title of the episode has Ensong in it. We'll be talking about that. That's big news that's dropping this week. Um, just a quick disclaimer, it's right now. Right now, today is Tuesday. We've only seen the Pano and Yujing reinforcements. So yep. if the other stuff is missing and you're watching this on a Saturday, sorry, we literally have not seen the videos because they're not posted yet. So we have <laughs> no idea. Saying, odds are, odds yeah. are most people listening to this know more about it than we do. It's true. So, but you get to hear all of our hot, incorrect takes and us on the internet and we're wrong on the internet. So you should be mad exactly. about it. Join our Discord and talk to us. <laughs> it means we're going to be wrong forever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, pretty much. It's fine. Um, yeah. yeah. So there's a there's a couple of uh, uh, September releases that are coming out, right? So we've got yes, the. Uh, do we have a picture for that? No, no pictures. They 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 told us War Corps what it was, and we could say it, but they didn't oh, give us okay. any pictures. Yet. So we're so. getting the general release for Bishi, the 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 new uh, Eugene character. If you haven't seen her, there's one in the ITS pack. You won, but uh, now there's going to be one that you can just buy. Uh, Svorza is going to be a general release sculpt yeah. as well, outside of Defiance. Uh, there's a Cosmoflot support pack, right? So we can expect the, the Doctors and such. Uh, combined Army Expansion Pack Alpha. What's in that? They haven't said for that or the support pack, because there's already a support pack for Code 1 for yeah, our... Kazakh, Doctor, or whatever. The yeah. Or whatever. So... Don't know. No idea what's going to be in the Cosmoflot support pack. Yep. Um, it could be... I mean, there's a couple of missing units still mm -hmm. um, out of Cosmoflot. So maybe... Yeah, maybe it's that. We'll see. Maybe we'll get like a war driver or something. Um, there's the a new Bakunin Uberfall Commando. Set well, we could get up. we could get the Ariadna Peripheral. We could oh, get the oh, uh, mm, there you go. Yeah, the remote Ned Kibot. I don't know. There you go. Um, and the mechanics and the Stranic Outer Patrol. I mean, that's a box right there. No, oh, yeah. There you go. Easy done. Um, the ITS season 15 tournament pack is coming out too, so that'll be fun. Uh, I'm particularly excited for the Uberfall Commando because that means I can run all three in Bakunin. Because I've got the original sculpts. Oh. Although the original sculpt, I broke the stupid like CC what weapon that she has. Uh, which is That's easy to do. Sad, yeah, it's so easy. Um, anyway, love those sculpts. Uh, I also really love the Unit Nine sculpts that I uh, made Adam buy for me when they did that pewter run. Uh, and then now I can have three of them, which will be great. Um, yeah. Right on. I think that they, I think that's it for the 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 news. Kind of light news, but I guess because we're going to go into heavily into the news is a feature, whatever. Oh, yeah. So, this button. It's happy time! Let's talk about some toys. Yeah, so I've had these models for a long time now, and I finally built them. Um, not sure when I'm going to run the bear, but it's a cool model. And I, mm -hmm. if nothing else, it's a good way to have a second uh, antipode pack handler. So, Sure. That? Uh, I feel then, similar uh, about the bear as I do about um oh geez, what was I gonna say? The uh never mind. They're just there's Spetsas? Yeah, the Spetsas. Spetsas uh, HMG. Yeah, it's just like this is a very good thing. Yeah, it's good. Also boring. Try yeah. Um Yeah, I agree. Uh the the Tomcat multi-rifle light shotgun though. That's fun. That's fun. 
Uh, I'm excited That's a about that. Bit of, of kit too, right? And doesn't it yeah, doesn't it have is, Gizmo kit? It's an engineer, yeah. Yeah. Pretty rad. And then I, I built I think that's like an orphan or something from Bakunin to go along with my stigmata. So there's that. Um yeah. I just got a whole pile of stuff that I'm slowly chugging through. Um I also have painted up or I started painting up my nomad rems from literally ten years ago. Um they've been <laughs> silver surfering it for a long ass time. And then the past like three years they've been primed and zenith highlighted. Now they finally so, have color. There's yeah. actually a lot I like about the old Nomad remotes. They're great. I really like the leg configuration, actually. Um, instead of just being another spider bot. Um yeah. I kind like of the like roller the, skates. Yeah, the roller skates on that big ball socket mm -hmm. um, at the hip is cool. Yeah. I mean, I felt like the only downside is the weapons are kind of mad. But the weapons are pretty potato. Yeah, that's true. But I, I do like them a lot. Uh, yeah. I had I had forgotten that they had little fins. I've got I've I've kept all the fins during my one of my bits box somewhere. Um but you can see sure. the stempler on actually that's a TR bot, bot but I'm using it as a stempler. Um and so I totally stole this from Eric Worth. Um he does this thing where his pan well, his he sold his pano, but his pano uh, remotes used to be progressively more orange the more dangerous they got. Right. Ooh. So like uh Fugazi had no orange, uh Pathfinder a little bit. And then the Sierra had a lot, along with whatever the um, the Clipper, right? And then Bulleteers obviously had the most orange. Um, so that was, I sort of did this like little Chevron thing on mine. That's cool. That's pretty fun. Yeah, it's kind of neat. Um, but yeah, what have you been up to? Uh, so Bushido has really taken off over at Shiv Games, and I went ahead and built and painted my whole uh, Kinshi faction. I guess the nine models. It's yeah, it's only nine models. It's not a ton. But yeah, had a lot of fun. I was able to use um, like a Zenith L Prime and then uh, the Express Paints to kind of set my values early. And then I used some, I dug out my um, Minotaur Ghost Tints. Oh, yeah. Which I are, use those. Yeah, they're pretty yeah, nice. I like them a lot. But they're they're kind of situational to use, I feel like. Yes. Um, they're, they're highly transparent. Mm-hmm. So using those to tint for the um, for the glowing effects worked really well. Uh, I was able to use like a dark blue purple for the outer edges and then a lighter blue on the inside blended all nicely. Um, and it came out pretty well together. Yeah, I had to do different shades of gray on everything. So there's warm grays and cool grays to make the different parts stand out against each other. Um, sure. It was a lot of fun, though. Cranked them out, did my usual um, super quick basing using some uh, pre-mix of flock um some leaves and some uh static grass clumps yeah, they yeah so that's fantastic. thank you master she of the kodai there yeah that's where i got a lot of the lighting effects in and also here mm -hmm. on ku um yeah had a lot of fun and then uh i finished assembling lauren's copy of leviathan <laughs> uh, sure <laughs> it's, it's i it, it is hers uh, according to everybody so I have to maintain that, but I decided to go for a classic ultramarine blue uh, paint job. I'm probably going to do more second edition style, so yellow instead of gold. Mm. Uh, caution stripes in the backs of the power fists. Of course. Red, red weapons. Yep. Um, the whole nine yards. But yes, yeah, so I got them all assembled and primed. Then what else did I do? Oh, I had one more thing. Oh, yeah, and this is uh, kind of out of the blue. Um, as most things are over at Shiv, uh, they they wanted to start playing uh, this game called Mythos, hmm. which is in the same universe um, as Wild West Exodus, but it's more oh. of a yeah, it's more of a Cthulhu-y, very small scale skirmish game. Isn't that the same universe as Dystopian Wars? Yes. Okay, they've sort of matched oh. them all together now. Yep. Yep. Um, and so I was like, sure, I'll, I'll, you, it's, it's one box of models and it's the whole faction. Oh, that's it. You're done. Yeah, these that's it. Six models. So it's like, that's it. Yeah. Oh. I was like, I really like these, these spooky Egyptian bug people. Like, sure. I'll pick that up and play some games with them. Um, I wasn't really, the, the, the photos didn't do justice to how big that middle one is. That's on like an 80 millimeter base. Holy crap. Yeah. That's it's huge. Uh, I mean, I've got it. Here we go. You got it like right here, right? Like 
it's it's big. <laughs> That's the size of like a tarantula. Yeah, like a like a real tarantula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a good size real tarantula. You should you so should like, get a, you should just get a stuffed one and then put it on a base. Right, so like here's like a, a normal size model next to it. Yeah, like it's it's a big ass model for a skirmish game to to use. Um, so whipped those up today. Nice. Yeah, I'm really happy to get the. It was funny the getting the Kinshi all built and painted um, meant that I was able to play Bushido with a faction fully painted before I'd ever played it, which has happened all of probably once <laughs> in my entire right. career yeah. of playing games. Yeah, never, never again either. <laughs> I know, right? Um. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I've been up to for hobby. Very cool. Like games. I like to do games. That's what I like to do. Uh, well, I haven't really played much. I've been traveling in the last couple of months or so, so I didn't have much time. Um, but I did get six games in on last Saturday, so we can talk about that later. Um, but you've you've got some uh, Bushido in, right, with Nate? Yeah, so I played a game of Bushido. This is where, where Nate and I both had fully painted forces and we had no idea how to play the game. Um, so that was pretty fun. That's how, like, that's I how had it should the, be, right? Right, I had the one demo with you and then I haven't touched it since, so completely gone from memory. Um, but yeah, I had a lot of fun playing. Uh, it's it's a pretty badass game. Uh, it, it's it's in, like Infinity in a lot of ways, um, but the alternating activation is really... Uh, really interesting. So, like, activation order becomes super important, um, and it's a much more uh, positional game, mm-hmm. which is weird because I feel like Infinity is super positional, but this yeah. I feel like. But but there's there's a lot more, like facing is a lot more relevant. I feel like. Yeah, facing is a lot more because, relevant. Not 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 because it's like a it, facing doesn't matter in Infinity, but the board is larger, so you're less likely to get past somebody. If that makes any sense. Yeah. And then um, you also have a lot more, a lot smaller scoring areas. Mm. So it's a lot more important that you stay in those scoring areas and you have more tools to move your opponent. Sure. Um, and kind of get them out of the way or move yourself around the opponent, things like that. So here we have one of my, um, one of my, yeah, uh, I forgot what they're called. Um, one of my Kinshi monks who, when they die, turns into a super spoopy ghost. So I was able to like teleport across the table through that uh, through the portal, get into combat with Nate. Then he killed me, which turned me into something even more powerful and just became this annoying tar pit for him to deal with. Well, that's so that was a pretty that yeah. That was awful. a pretty fun yeah. It was a pretty fun part uh, highlight of the game. Um, nice. So yeah, Kinshi's whole mechanic where they they set up these portals around the table and they get to teleport through them. So here we have. Another one of my uh, one of my monks who basically went through the portal and then got wrecked. Uh, but it was a cool picture first. Yeah, there you go. So, and then I got to play against uh, the the Ito master himself, Jeff, um, over at Shiv Games, and yeah, uh, also learned that I still know nothing about how to play this game or the faction. Uh, but I had a lot of fun in the process. So. Like factional wise, this they're all tricks with very little direct damage dealing. Like nothing, you know, your typical weapons have like plus one or even plus two or three to their damage that they roll on the chart, and they have nothing none of that nonsense. Everything is plus zero. Um so and they don't have any ways to mitigate armor. So it's a lot more it's a faction that's much more about uh board control and positioning um than like picking off individual targets before like slipping away through a portal. Um, I see. And I did none of those things when I played against Jeff. <laughs> so he wrecked me, but it was a lot of fun. The games go pretty quick, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to try my hand at uh, building a two by two table. I think that'll be fun. Well, one of the interesting things, so at first I wanted to build like a static table, but the terrain positioning is actually like a very terrain setup is a very relevant part. Oh of yeah, the absolutely. Game. Yeah. Um, so I'm probably gonna end up just doing a game mat and then just getting really nice terrain for the mat. 
Yeah, um, Frank Frank was kind enough to print out a bunch of uh, terrain for me, which I need to to you know clean and then thanks. and then airbrush. But uh, what I was thinking is sort of taking a, a, a the idea from your island table, where you have like the two pieces that kind of slide together. And you can either put them mm -hmm. in the corners of the table, or you can put them on the side of the table, right? For sure. Um, and then doing like a doing a, a little hill that can turn into like a little valley or like something like that, right? Like a fish. Mm -hmm. I think that'll be that'll be pretty neat. Um, so I I I kind of want to do that and invest a little more time in sculpting the stuff, sort of like we we did for the uh, Mount Doom. Sure. I think that'll be cool. Yeah, we can see. In this picture, there's those three rings. So those are the scoring areas. You have to be fully within the ring to score for the objective. Um, and the thing I should have been doing is not running up and trying to punch his better fighters in the face. Um, what I should have been doing is like throwing his guys all out of the ring to score early in the game before my guys get powered up later, later in the game to just wreck him. Gotcha. But I know that now. Now you know. And knowing is half the battle. There you go. Um, <laughs> so, still, uh, yeah, Lauren's the uh, peanut gallery over there, if anyone can hear it. Um, all right, John, so what have you, uh, you've been reading a book and sharing it with us a bit, and it sounds really amusing, but I'm glad I don't have to read it because I hear enough of it from you. Yeah, so I've been uh, reading a book called A Libertarian Walks Into a Bear, right? So this is sort of a play on the the so and so, such and such, and whoever walk into a bar pun, right? Sure. Or like the, the setup line. Um, but basically, the general premise is there's a town called Grafton, um, in the northeast. A US. real town, right? Like a, a real, it's a real place. This is this is not a it's not a, a made up thing. This is a journalist that like went there, interviewed real people about real events, and wrote a book about it. And basically, the long and the short of it is uh, actually I have, I have Frank to thank me uh, thank for this because he's the one who recommended this book. Um, it's it's pretty funny in the sense that uh, the like the actual the actual material is is very disheartening, but it's written in a very dry wit fashion, which I really enjoy. Um, so like just just for for some for some uh, from some color, right? So there's some quotes from the book, right? Uh, what's the end game of capitalism if not a big fat white man sitting on top of a pile of bloody bones with no one around him crying because nobody's around to make him a sandwich? Right, so that's just like straight up in the book. Um, <laughs> other one was like the setup is, uh, you know, they don't want to be told to put out a fire in the middle of a dry forest, uh, and so the, the the that's when a deputy fire warden from the neighboring town of Enfield pulled over on Route Four and told Barksley, one of the people in the book, that the unpermitted fire could accidentally ignite either the nearby shed or a pile of wood chips. Barksley declined to stuff the fire on the theory that the actual danger was very small and their desire to roast hot dogs was very great. Um, and then my, my favorite is like, it, it just so happens that if a bunch of people don't want to like organize large scale stuff to like help each other out, things sort of start to fall apart. Um, and so the response is uh, like the, the sort of like uh, the discussion of uh, uh, some bad things that happened and, and then the people that live there, some people lost heart and were leaving the area because they sort of gave up on this sort of utopian ideal that they were trying to manifest. Um, but some stayed, and then so the quote from the book about that is, but to the substantial number of Freetowners who kept the faith, infighting was not the main problem. The main problem, they maintained, that was that was, was that taxes were too high, rules too suffocating, statism too overbearing, and authority too abundantly wielded. Though daily life was getting more difficult, they were, at heart, idealists and romantics. Thing would, things would improve, they insisted. They just needed more freedom. So that's that's like the book. <laughs> it's just like, that's the whole thing. Um, and it's been, it's been a wild ride just reading it. Uh, you know, it was a pretty, it was a pretty jarring, uh, jump from the, my last book recommendation, which is about like dragon people, <laughs> right. on like sure, floating sure. islands to this, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's been, uh, an educational and very witty read so far. So I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it. That at least sounds amusing for like what happens when you let the people who want to like abolish the fire department run a town. Yeah, that's literally no. what happened. They abolished the fire part, fire department. Like, there's no fire <laughs> department. Yeah, there, there was no fire department for a significant period of time, and then like the the houses were just burned down, and like that that was it, <laughs> right? Like, who could have possibly foreseen, right? What, what happened? Yeah, and so like the the book actually follows the story of like another town which is nearby. I forget the name of it right now. And this Grafton place, 
and they both like start the same way. They're like not that they're geog geog geographically quite close, so it's not mm -hmm. like a you know different area, different sort of natural phenomena are happening. Like the same stuff is happening to both towns, and the same people sure. you know move there roughly. But then like one went this one way, and the other people were like, you know, taxes are fine, we'll pay them, and we'll have a fire department, and they're doing great. <laughs> Weird. Um, but yeah, the, the 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 premise is that things got so bad. Uh, that bears just show up and then like everybody wants everybody else to solve the bear problem and it's not their problem. So then the bears just like kill all their chickens and their cats and eat people and stuff. It's bad. Jesus. Also, if you feed bears, like the, I, I think somebody was interviewed for the book, but declined to give permission to let the author use their name. So she's just known as donut lady and so named because she feeds the bears donuts. And so obviously they stick. Oh, up. nothing wrong could happen. You know, nothing bad could Happen from yep. getting your bears used to approaching people for food. Yeah, so that's the thing. Uh, it's a, it's worth a read if you're interested in that kind of stuff. I'm I'm enjoying it. Yeah, that's it. Well, the, it uh, that's it for me. Well, right on. Okay, so before we get to our main to our double feature, uh, it's time for our Shiv Game sponsorship. So Shiv Games, the best selling store in Kaiser, Oregon. Uh, they have a new website, Shiv Games. Um, at, is here to sponsor us like they do every week. This week, they're giving away a a very specifically a Bushido Silver Moon Syndicate blister of your choice or a Panoceana blister for Infinity. All you have to do for your chance to win is type in the chat, Bushido is the new Infinity uh, for your chance to win. Um, oh. There you go. Yeah, so, so very specifically factions that Cole isn't playing so that Cole can't win again. Um, and, and, and there you go. Uh, I think I don't know if spaces are relevant you, for John. You need spaces, Frank. You need spaces, Frank. Um, um, yeah. So while we're doing that, one thing that I just did was I, I did this brown sugar bourbon plus stout. Very good. Ooh, it's delicious and highly nutritious. I think that's what I think. Yeah, it makes it more nutritious, right? Mixing the yeah, two. Yeah, that's how that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Jeff, as ever, ever <laughs> is uh, getting more and more specific with his request for prize support, and I'm enjoying every moment of it. Um, yeah, Infinity Bushido's works. a lot of fun. Infinity's a lot of fun. They're both very good games. All right, I think it's time. All right, hitting the button. Here we go. Hey, congratulations to Tanaka Skyler. Cool. I'll go ahead and shoot you information or shoot you a message and uh, tell you how to get in touch with Jeb over at Shiv. So thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you, Shiv Games, once again, for your continued support. All right. I've got one of these buttons. It's time for our main feature. Time for one of our main features. Indeed. OK. So uh, again, quick disclaimer, if you've jumped ahead to this section, uh, today is Tuesday. Uh, July 18th, uh, which means all we've seen are the Pano and Yujing profiles and details. We, uh, we know nothing about any of the other factions. Uh, the other caveat is I would say that um, the stuff that uh, the on tabletop guys put out is great. However, um, Bostria and the people doing the graphics for CB don't always have the right information in the graphic. Yes. Uh, they actually caught that live while they were talking. Uh, there was a problem with, I believe, the Squalo profile uh, or dossier, which they sorted out. Um, so everything that we say right now uh, is a is an educated guess, um, even if we're looking at the profile that they published. Um, and you know, we have to wait until Army is is updated to know the the real truth, uh, and then we probably have to wait a few weeks for them to correct all the incorrect data in the database. So. This is a rolling thing. This is a this is a normal uh, happening for a CB release. We love them. They're doing a great job. They're understaffed, um, so we give them a lot of leeway. But just, just you know, just take everything we say with uh, with that with that knowledge. Exactly. Uh, big disclaimer. Yes. <laughs> so, all right. So let's talk about what we know so far. Uh, this is all coming again from those um, on videos. tabletop. Yep. Yep videos so first let's talk about the reinforcement rule itself or the rules itself right um so we know that it is going to be an its extra which i think is fantastic personally 
Um, that I, one of the things I was concerned about is that it was going to add like a new set of rules that you had to buy into, and if you didn't have it, you didn't get to use it, and you would feel left behind uh, and dunked on, and you know you'd feel like your opponent has an unfair advantage in your games. Um, by setting it up as an ITS extra, it just becomes a a mode that you can play in or not, uh, yeah. and I think that's that's really cool. I also like that they made it opt in instead of opt out, like they did with the uh, fifteen order cap, right, or fifteen fifteen trooper cap. Uh, that caused a lot of contro uh, controversy the last time. I think it's right. healthier for the game. This is not the forum to debate that, but uh, having to opt in, I think, is is generally a better practice when you when you do something this disruptive to the structure of the game. Sure, sure. Um, and then it, so one of the other things that does is it changes the standard game size. Yes. Instead of playing 300 points, you are playing uh, 250 points and five SWC of your main force, mm -hmm. which, from what I can tell, is limited still to a single combat group of 10 models. And then you have 100 points and two SWC to spend separately on a reinforcement combat group. Right. So when you do list construction, basically what you do is, let's, I don't know, let's say you pick uh, ISS, right? For, sure. for uh, as an example, those 250 points are ISS army list as normal. You you just build a smaller list, um, one combat group, and then the hundred points uh, is drawn specifically from a separate list of available models, which also have their own fire team construction rules, um, AVA point costs, special profiles of different kit, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and you 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 buy that with 100 points and two SWIC, um, and and that's your that's what's called your reinforcements. One additional note um, is that to enable reinforcements, you have to take what's called a com link, and that is sort of like um, you know having having a lieutenant, right? Yeah. You have to have a lieutenant in your in your in your list to make it a legal list. If you want to play with reinforcements, you also have to buy a profile. That has the word comlink attached to it somewhere on its unit profile. Um, yeah, I'm hoping they do something interesting with that, and it's not just like a here buy a line Kazakh. Right. So that's that's one of the things that they suggested is absolutely going to be the case, right? So you can take yeah. a rando line trooper from your faction, you can buy it with a comlink, and just be done. Uh, one important note is the reinforcements, I believe, are limited to five unit slots, right? Yep. And it's five something. slots, one hundred yep. points, two yep. swig. Um, however, there will be units, and Carlos specifically mentioned the Havza, whether or not it's actually Havza or not, we don't know, um, but you'll get like special comm links with additional bonuses, right? So comm link plus one, comm link plus two, and that increases the unit cap slots. So you can take six units if you mm -hmm. have comm link plus one, or seven if you have comm link plus two, uh, but you don't get extra points, so that just means you get more, more units in that combat group. Okay, and that's kind of an interesting tool to help mitigate like the fact that Aria that tends to be cheaper. And Hawk, right? Specifically with that example. Yeah, and Hawk. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it's also, it's 255, 102. And it, it is really like those seven armies. You can't have like 257 points with 93 points of reinforcements. Right. Yeah, um, exactly. Um, yeah. So, and then, yeah, you mentioned that the reinforcements are going to be specific profiles. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things we get down to talking about the profiles, they're showing them already. These are specifically the reinforcement version of their profile entries. Yeah. Uh, it's not so immediately instance, clear if the point costs are going to be different. Like, for example, you know, uh, like a like a line Kazakh in normal TAC, right? Right. Is one cost. It might be cheaper in reinforcements. We don't know, right? We're not 100% sure yet. Until yeah. we see everything. So. We're, yeah, not, we're not super sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like they might have a profile that's only available as reinforcement. They might have versions of the same units that are only available as not reinforcements. Mm -hmm. um, so you know when we go through these, we know that there are going to be more profiles for these units. Um, they've also said or implied, I felt like he's outright said that these units will be available in their respective armies as well as non-reinforcement units. Yes, they've also intimated that they're going to. Uh, a release packs, right? Specifically designed yeah. so you can like buy a thing and then get the things you need to have reinforcements for your chosen faction. Um, yeah, we've got a, those that will that yeah. will will bring. 
Um, yeah. Um, and also, uh, you know, some of these things, especially for armies that are out of print, will get new and updated sculpts for some of these profiles, which is nice. That's that's a huge deal. Yeah. Um, you might you know you might see Mervinji on the table again. Um, mm-hmm. All right. So now the way the the way I understand this works is your reinforcements are held off the table. And then at some point in time, they'll enter the table. Um, I forgot what step it is. It's after command tokens to move models in the combat groups. Um, yeah, it's it's during the, what is it, the tactical phase? Right? Yeah, or it's right after the, yeah. Um, yeah, so, it's, so it's, it, like, it's intended that they are in their own separate combat group. So you, you do it after command token usage to prevent you from having them on the table and then like refilling your decimated primary pool with right. like new orders. Right. They want Actually, to avoid pull, that. Why don't you pull a picture? I think I took a picture of this slide um and dropped it into the file. Okay, I'm sorry. sorry. Um find it. I don't I don't think you did. Oh shit. I meant to. <laughs> so but um right so we know that they come on they are gonna come in automatically at turn three. Um and then there's a there. I don't know if it's like a chance to bring them on turn two, or if it is just you bring them on automatically turn two, based on the criteria. So um, the, yeah, the criteria is if you if you're down to two hundred points out of your two fifty or below, right? Mm-hmm. Then then the reinforcements are called early, but we don't know if that's a a roll or that automatically happens. Right or yeah, if it's a roll like a like a whip roll or again a role that can be modified based on something else or really we don't quite know how that happens just yet they haven't released the exact wording of the rules mm-hmm. um but basically the only thing that has been said is carlos mentioning if you have suffered 50 points of losses then you'll be trying to bring them on in turn two um and that's kind of like 50 points isn't a lot but at 50 points out of 250 that's 20 percent of your force in the first turn um so it's a little bit of a catch-up mechanic, which is kind of nice. If you're getting your butt kicked, I mean, if you're both equally kicking each other's butts, then you're both going to bring them on in turn two. Um, yeah. So here's here's that here's that uh, here's. graphic. I, I just went to the YouTube video. Basically, oh, you just command tokens, then you get reinforcements, and then you check retreat. Um, then you check loss of lieutenant, and then you do your orders. All right. So it keeps you from going into retreat. Brutal cities. Purveyor of fine MDF cool. terrain, yeah. um, making your city's brutal. Three fifty. Uh, yeah, it's not. It's not uh, entirely. Sure. It's not entirely clear yet. Yeah, we'll we'll get we'll get the rules. Um, funnily enough, we have the end song book. Um, we've it's yeah. basically one hundred and sixty <laughs> pages of fluff. Um, there aren't any rules in it, which is why we can't just like dump all the the hot deets all over everybody, right? Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, it arrived yesterday and I haven't had a chance to swing by Adams yet. So yeah, the lore is really cool. It has a couple of missions, but no, no rules. And, and honestly, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, because if you know, the, you know, the, the opposite is you buy a rule book and then the rules are outdated after the first FAQ. Yeah. This is absolutely the right call by them. I think, uh, cause you can but opt I... into to getting the book if you want or not. Right. Like, accidentally hit the soundboard. You did. You, you hit the brutal city stinger. Oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, there you go. Plug for brutal cities. They make great shit. Yeah. Um, okay. So after the reserves come on, you're going to place a drop pod marker, which looks like a 25 mil base um, on the, uh, on the table. And then you deploy the models from your reinforcements within eight inches of that. So basically, it works a lot like the old mech deployment rule, mm-hmm. which you know is a hundred percent what mech deployment was meant to kind of represent. Um, yep, there we go. But you will not be able to deploy past the halfway mark. Yeah. Okay. So for those of you who can't see because you're on the audio only podcast, the text says player places a drop pod token um, completely inside their half of the table. It looks to be a twenty five millimeter base. I'm just guessing here. Um, but that's probably yeah. what it is. Um, so you put it somewhere on your side of the table. Uh, all of the troopers in the player's reinforcement section, along with the peripherals, deployable weapons, or equipment, must be deployed completely inside the drop pod's zone of control and completely inside their half of the game table. Right. So, oh, completely inside is is a very relevant. Yeah. Difference. I mean, that was that was the case for uh, for um, mechanized deployment. You'd place something 
uh, and then that, you place like a unit that has mech deploy. Every other unit that also had mech deploy would have to be within uh, zone of control of that thing, right? Sure, but so like in zone of control meant that your 55 mil base could hang out of the eight inches, right? Before but that's not that's not true now. Now it's not you, you now. get a you get a uh, effectively uh, what is that? That'd be 16 and a half, right? Roughly inch radius so, or sorry yeah. diameter. So it'd be 17 inch diameter, right? Yeah. Um, so that's the, that's, that's Same. the thing. Um, and you, you can get stuff right up to the center line, but then you basically lose half of your deployment area, which may be fine, depending what you have. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So you really have to think about where you want to place that. Um, it is kind of cool. I was just thinking about how the not doing it, not coming in turn one and only coming in turn two, if you've suffered 50 points of damage, right. Assuming that that's how that works. Um, it does mean that neither player never has more than 300 points on the table. I mean, like, sure. unless you get to turn three with, you know, less than 50 points of losses. That's fair. Um, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, this, I think, is a response to people getting completely tabled, right? It gives you a chance to yeah. actually have stuff that's safe, that's invincible until later in the game. Um, yeah, I mean, it kind of does a lot of things, right? Like it lets them it lets them address smaller sectorals, yeah, uh, in their design space instead of having to come up with a whole sectoral worth of models, right? Yeah, so I mean, uh, maybe maybe let's take a look at um, sort of the implications of this for like the game in general, right? So, so speaking specifically to like I guess CB's business model, I think your your point is extremely valid, right? It allows them to produce things for say NCA, uh, which is the um, the the pano reinforcements. Uh, so mm -hmm. they can get things like bolts, and they don't have to produce the whole bolt line again. They can just produce stuff that's relevant for reinforcements, and sort of uh, slowly build out uh, a, a like a, a library of new models for Merovingia, let's say, or NCA, or whatever they end up doing. They're expanding Yujing with the Koreans. We'll talk about that in, uh, in a little while. Um, and so it lets them sort of slow roll a sectorial boot, uh, uh, boot up or reboot, which I think is sure. a, a good move by them. It also keeps those those things um, uh, relevant and also gives people who play only NCA a thing to spend their money on, right? So those are people where Infinity is like, you know, not their primary game. They have NCA, they're done, and uh, they can now buy new bolt sculpts, which is pretty fun. Or even That's if you play any, any one sectoral, it's always kind of nice to be able to dabble a little bit in something yeah. else. Yeah, exactly. Right? So, um, I mean, this is good, right? Because eventually, let's say they, they do take the, the, um, the Korean... Uh, in the reinforcements and then you like balloon that out into a complete sectoral on its own beyond what's in white banner already yeah um and and then you know that gives you a way to grow your force in, in an organic fashion that because you're just adding stuff to the things you already have uh and already enjoy so i think that's pretty cool yeah. it's smart it, of them it, to do it this way i think so yeah i think so as well I, again also liking that it's a different it is a different play way to play i guess um which is both good and bad, but I think it's mostly good. It does divide yeah. you know, your, your player base. You're going to have people that play re reinforcements and people that don't. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that be if the units are available outside of the reinforcements, reinforce, like you're good, people are going to, a lot of times people are going to have the models anyways, right? So it's like you might as well play in reinforcements. It's like, oh, I've got it. It's not valid ITS extra, boom. Or yeah. again, you'll hit, you'll hit the people that are collectors who are just like, yeah, I play I play Ariana. I just have tack, but I just like a little it'd be fun to have it's like something new or something fresh, a little something mm -hmm. a little bit different. Something, you know, to paint a slightly different color camo scheme on my <laughs> um, taco chips. Yeah, this is actually making me really excited about my Pan Oceana. So I've got um military orders mm -hmm. that I have more or less like I was thinking I should, I'm just gonna sell them. Like they're uninteresting to me. There's not a lot of interesting new I'm so excited about them. They were, I mean, they were really fun at the beginning, but they're pretty, I mean, I I guess I feel like they're kind of a known quantity. Like I see. You uh, figure them out, and now you're bored. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, um, and I was like, maybe I want to do uh, Varuna instead, because they've got a lot of interesting, more interesting tools. Sure. And then, like, adding these other NCA units well, in there. Well, Varuna, I have Echo Bravo that I'm trying to move, so. Nope. Um, but these, uh, yeah, these other interesting units gives me at least a little bit of variety. Like, oh, if I want to mix up playing military orders, boom, I can play reinforcements. 
And that's sure. gonna be a very different game. Um, yeah, so I, I think from that perspective, it's good. It gets people to buy more models, and that's how CB as a company stays afloat because they're surely not making any money off their rules, right? And that wasn't yeah. a dig at them. They just give them away from free is what I'm getting at. As um, they should. We're, not, they should. we're not complaining. No complaints. CB, keep doing that. Yeah, yeah, no, good, good on you. Um, but as far as gameplay is concerned, right? So this, these are hot takes. I obviously have not played any reinforcements because it's all like brand spanking new, and I haven't. Uh, played a game of Infinities uh, since they've come out. Um, yeah, I, I think obviously uh, this makes armies more resilient or lists more resilient to alpha strikes because you literally just get more units later and you get them yeah. sooner if uh, if you, you suffer a bad alpha. So that's a thing. It also um, cuts down actually on alpha potential a little bit because you're talking 250 and 5 instead of 306 and like that was something I noticed from when we were playing our escalation, when we were playing the escalation league, yeah, for in preparation for our tournament, mm -hmm. is at the two fifty price point, um, you're giving up something to get to squeeze into that into that price value, right? Sure. And in reinforcements, you're only going to have one order pool. Sure. So if you're going first, you're going to get those orders docked by two. Um, it just feels like there's a there's a lower you you have less at the beginning of the game to go do an alpha strike with. Um, I I would agree in principle with that statement. The counter the counter to that though, I would sort of sub, like gently push back on it, which is to say that your opponent also has less to stop you. Right? Sure, sure. And so at two fifty, you're made you're faced with this choice: either you have a balanced list where you have a lot some attack, some defense, um. And you're thereby more vulnerable to an alpha because you just don't have 50 points of stuff that you would use to defend that you're willing to just throw away, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whereas if you if you sort of like, I don't know, you take a look at Eric's list for the um, for the uh, for the league, right? He's basically running anathematic all five games. Sure. So if you're not ready for that, it's just going to delete you, right? Sure. Um, and so, so I think I think there's there's uh, like I think it directly affects um, you know like makes you more resilient to alpha. Well, I do think also that it probably will make second turn even stronger than it already is. Maybe, maybe because... I wonder. If it'll... Yeah, good. I was your, just saying, I wonder if there will be a a selection of suggested missions for it, or what would be super cool. Hear me out. Okay. Is somebody. Uh, makes a website where people can submit missions to, and one of the things you can rate it, the missions on is on um, oh boy. Uh, appropriate appropriateness for reinforcement ITS extra. So you're suggesting a registered domain? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I'm I'm just saying that it'd be really cool if there's a place where people could submit their ITS missions, and one of the things that they could uh, rate things on is yeah. What's what's the web what's the website, Adam? Nathan wants to know. <laughs> what is it? Am I reinforcements or not? Um, am I reinforcements or not? Yeah, actually, that's not a bad idea. It would be cool to um, have a website like that. Yeah, what if, I mean, what if, I mean, a little bit of a tangent, but what if you could have a website where a community could submit missions, whether it's a, just a PDF link or text input or something, right? Mm -hmm. You could thumbs up, thumbs down it on overall quality. You could rate them on a one to five on complexity, mm -hmm. and maybe thumbs up, thumbs down, or a, a, a rating for some of the ITS extras. I guess specifically uh, f if the mission is good for or feels balanced for uh, reinforcements. Then you could throw together a tournament. You could be like, boom, I want to just pick the missions that are good for reinforcements and not complex. Okay, I'm I'm sort of mulling over how much. It Ass pain that's going to be for me. Um, <laughs> I can help you design the plan. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, all right. We'll think about it. I, I right, do just, think we just putting it out there. Okay, so so the, the like the other hot take that I want to sort of bring up this sort of happened in, in the Discord, um, which is this is a fun and exciting new way to play, um, and it does help CB sell more models. Uh, I would also say you could also just. Uh, give us missions that are not the same for the last like five years. Sure. Sure. Also a thing well, that so is possible. 
one of the things in this web looks like could host though is an archive of all of the past ITS missions. We have them all. All right, fine, we'll do it. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Just say we have all the missions. We've played all the missions before. This is true. We actually don't have all the ITSs. I have everything up to five on my computer. Down back to down down back to five? Yeah, back to five. Okay, so Infinity Community, if you have one through four, please send them send them our way on mailbag at late night wargames.com. Yeah, I wonder if I wonder if they had PDFs back then. I couldn't find anything. Uh, I don't know. Maybe somebody has them. You could also add, reach out and ask Coney or something. Maybe Heloise. They, they, I, right. I hope they have them still. <laughs> right. Um. <laughs> okay. Uh, other th- like so other hot takes I had on the, on the car ride home. I think camo is going to be very is going to be even stronger now. Or anything anything with a marker state, I guess I should say. Um. And here's why, sure. right? So. Typically, the way an Infinity game goes is you you start, maybe you get off of maybe you don't. You sort of develop your your uh, board state into turn two, um, and then especially for area control missions or stuff that is, like really heavily favors second uh, second player scoring or end of game scoring, right? Um, you turn three is where all the magic happens, right? And typically, uh, if you're going second and you're playing uh, with a laser focus on the objectives, you do stuff like. Uh, remove arrow pieces, uh, establish board control, remove orders of uh, your opponent's orders to sort of like give you freedom of movement, right? Um, and this basically is a full stop to that, right? It's like a hard no, because all of a sudden, like you could literally just drop a bunch of ARO stuff down, like quality, uh, quality ARO pieces that are, work well in the midfield with templates or biz mods or visors. Uh, stuff to, like that would just really limit movement. We're, we're seeing that you can also drop uh, equipment and peripherals, right? Which means you could just like suddenly have mines that you can't ARO to, right? The placement of or the mm-hmm. moving to place. So so basically what, what this is doing is either at the top of two or at the top of three, one or both players is just going to get to completely change the battlefield and just add ARO's in a fashion that don't allow, um, sorry, yeah, add, add ARO's in a fashion that you cannot respond to. Right, you can you can counter deploy stuff, right? So if somebody puts down like an attack piece, you can put your arrow pieces covering that, and they have to contend with that. But basically, what this does in my mind will sort of create uh, a, a web of interlocking arrows somewhere between turn and turn three, turn two and turn three that you were not prepared for. You don't know what's coming. You can guess, but you, but you just don't know. So this sort of I think makes things like uh, the Aragato KHD like the most OP unit in the game after this, right? Because you can just turn into marker state, go 14 inches, be someplace you need to be that's out of line of fire stuff, and then do what you need to do to win the game. So I think I think that will sort of shift at least my initial approach to playing reinforcements, which is to to take a lot of stuff that has access to marker state, uh, take a lot of stuff that has access to, to smoke, white noise, that kind of thing, to give me that movement later on, and it will encourage me to be even more judicious with my preservation of orders throughout the game in terms of keeping stuff alive. Um, and really hammering, said- hammering down. I mean, in in some sense, it's actually probably better to like obliterate the crap out of your opponent on turn one, let them show up on turn two, kill the crap out of them, and then have an extra hundred points and an extra five to six orders, depending on what you know, uh, com link thing you have to just just completely um, establish board control on the top of three. So. I mean, That's there's I'm just thinking like there's also the um, the possibility of like how are hidden deploy units going to work with this? I mean, I think they work the same way as deployment works now. You say it's my turn to deploy. Turn around, please. Right. So then they're going to go through like the process with like mine layer and enemy camo market. Interesting. Probably. Probably. I mean, that would, that would super suck, right? Can you imagine, right? Like you set up your link team and then you drop something <clears> with mine layer on them, like that would. I know, that sounds right? terrible. <laughs> so I, I, I hope I hope they make that part of the rule. So that would be a really miserable experience. Yeah, hopefully. We'll see. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of like what are the what are the ways that this could really break? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's hard to say. I'm sure I'll find something and you'll find something that we'll we'll try. Uh like Carlos was saying, right? Like people are gonna find some degenerate edge case and just you know, really really abuse it. Um I I I'm I'm cautiously optimistic though. I think it'll be a fun. I mean, if nothing else, it'll be a fun diversion, right? It'll be just sort of like a new mission mode 
Uh, and so that will bring some some freshness and some life to um, to the game. And one of the things that I personally was feeling right now is, uh, you know, I felt a little bit kind of like I don't. I was at a loss for what to play next. Um, I wasn't really like I, I just took tack to the previous tournament that I played last Saturday, and I was feeling kind of meh about it. I really enjoyed the games that I did play, but I wasn't really feeling the list design process for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, it felt really like, uh, awkward and stagnant to me in a way that I did not enjoy. Um, but but now that there's like a whole other avenue of you know, interactions and timings to explore, that's that's going to be fun to try new stuff. Yeah, and and Dan yeah. Dan has an excellent point, right? Maybe the change to mind layer was a direct, you know, uh, uh, you know, result of playtesting reinforcements. Mm. Right? Okay, that's that's actually fair. that's actually a really a really smart uh, and and uh, insight there. And Aaron Aaron is saying right, like you can you might be us nomads might get lunacods with koalas, which is which is fine. I mean, having played with a lot of koalas, they don't really do do much. Unfortunately, <laughs> unacceptable. Right, it's Can't just they that. just people just dodge and they go away, uh, or they yeah. just throw something under the bus and they go away. So, I mean, like, uh, yeah, like a koala can just you can just like walk a heavy infantry through a koala and they usually are fine. They might not make a big wound. So. Well, yeah, no, there's it's gonna be, I mean, the night it's gonna be fun. It's gonna mix things up, right? Like that's what we yeah. want. Yeah, the absolutely. Of- I mean, I I think as a as a new like I. I have concerns about balance, concerns about like uh, how this will change unit valuations, which is not a bad thing, right? It's just a different way of playing. Um, but I am, I, I'm not sure how I, f- what, what the interactivity level will feel like and whether it'll be a positive or a negative play experience for people, mm-hmm. right? Um, so that, I, I don't know. I just, we just have to try it. Uh, but in terms of novelty and excitement, I'm 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 excited. It's going to be a good time. Um, yeah, and and so, uh, Nathan has uh, the correct the correct attitude, which is drop pod token design time. Uh, it almost makes me want to buy a space uh, space. I almost said space machine, space marine, space machine, space machine, like uh, space, space marine drop pod, uh, because that would be a really cool thing to do. Like that actually would be really interesting, right? Like not only. Well, yeah, it's a rad model, but then you, it stays on the table, and then that would be a fun, like, not only do you add reinforcements to the table, you also add terrain to the table, which you and I, are, you know, obviously are on board with. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that, that, it might be a little large. It's a little large, and it's like, it's very 40k looking. Yeah. Like, even though there's no mandatory skulls on the model, like, it is a very 40k looking piece of terrain. I mean, that's just because it's been around for so long, but yeah. Sure, but like that that's that's not wrong. <laughs> what's what's the Tyranid equivalent called? Wasn't there one? Tyrannocyte. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some I played this guy way back in grad school. He had some beautiful scratch built tyrannocytes. That were really neat. He had like all these like tentacles and like big um alien franchise egg pod vibe. Really nice. That's rad. Yeah. Um well, cool. So before we uh, move on to the next segment, let's quickly go through what we have seen for the two armies and then maybe just, just quick, quickly mention the names of the other ones. So for Pain Oceana, we have Code Capital, the Neo Terran Support Force. Um, it's the Neo Terran stuff. All right. So, Pretty straightforward. Yeah. So we've got a bunch of new stuff that I have no idea what it is, right? So we've got. They've actually called, shown. I think they've, all they've, the they've shown it, right? But I haven't really looked at it in great detail. So I, okay. I kind of wanted to keep myself fresh. I know you've looked at it, so it'll be, oh, it'll be go. good. It's it'll a, be good to have like a uh, like truly hot takes. Just truly hot takes, right? So we've got something called blockers, something called blade ops. We've got bolts, orcs, aquila guards, Swiss guards, squalo Mark twos, which is not the same as Mark one. Um, yep. Pathfinders, bulleteers, uh, palbots to go with your doctors and stuff. Um, uh, Fusilier in Richard Quinn, aka uh, John Wick. Uh, then we have Shona Carano, uh, Agnes, um, and then our our fire team options are bolts and blockers, um, squallows and bolts, and then we uh, basically like a ton of things are wild card. So these blade op things are bolts. We've got orcs, Aquila, uh, you know the the uh, Direfos character, um, Richard Quinn, Shona Carano, and then of course because NCA is silly, you can. You put bulleteers and fire teams because they needed that. Obviously, they were just unusable before. 
um, and pathfinders. And I think this is the first time we've actually been able to put pathfinders in links. Yeah, that's going to be rad. Um, so a couple of things to note here is that it's only like the availabilities are all super low. Uh -huh. uh, one blocker, two blade ops, four bolts, uh, two orcs, two pal bots, everything else is one. Yeah. Um, so you're, it's obviously designed because you're only going to have five models in the combat group. You can't have five bolts, even if you wanted. Yep. You have to take a blocker in there or a blade op. Blade ops do count as but bolts. But you still get the pure fire team bonus. Um, yeah, if you use um, if you use blade ops, yeah, blade you can get the pure fire team bonus. Uh, blockers don't seem to count as bolts of this. Um, I kind of wish they called so, them edge lords instead of blade ops, but you know, whatever. Right. The other thing is they have a lot of uh, so they do have a lot of wild cards. So it does feel like like to me this feels like a squad is landing. Yeah. Right. Like which is which is really cool. I like that a lot. Um, one thing that's really interesting is uh, in the I did watch the videos. So in the Pano video, um, Carlos was saying that and we'll talk about this in a minute. The uh, the Squalo normally has an HMG, right? But the reinforcements version has an AP Spitfire, um, and that's to represent yeah. the the need for a shorter, closer in range band. Um, and the fact that Shona is in here is really rad. And the reason for that is Dude, because um, dropping her in there, right? Holy hell! I mean, that's the thing because usually you, you take Shona and you're like, okay, she's just sort of along for the ride until you get to the midfield, and then somebody like dares to get close to you, right? Yeah, right. Like, I mean, that has its own value. It's a go away bubble, right? Um, but now you can force the issue and drop Shona on stuff, and as Tim would say, do kung fu. <laughs> or I guess Shona would call it Hima, but you know, whatever. Yeah, do do the do the Hema. Yeah. Um, and then so that Squallow does get to wild or get to duo with a bolt. Mm -hmm. Um, but more importantly, that opens it up to wild card. So you could have a Squallow with Shona mm -hmm. as your as your duo. Um, or uh, probably probably quite a bit better is the uh, Squallow with the Blade Ops because mm -hmm. um, they have an engineer profile. I mean. I guess that's okay, but you know, I, I kind of feel like uh, my personal philosophy is taking safety nets is uh, is perhaps uh, leaves leaves some optimization on the table. Sure. Yeah. Um, and also, if you're doing that, you're you're cutting down the number of uh, number of models you're getting. Yeah, right. In your... That could be a bolt, <laughs> which is kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Yeah, like that you are limited to a hundred points. Right, yeah, but I think so, I think the uh, the slots is even more relevant. Yeah, hundred points and five slots makes that really hard. But nothing yeah. in here, like you don't have anything either. It's cheap. Sure. Yeah, I, I guess like you can take the the cheaper bullets here, the cheaper pathfinder. Yep. Like, it'd I wonder how path. It'd be interesting to see how much the Swiss costs. Right, and you know what? Honestly, I was just thinking that pathfinder must not have the ox bot, otherwise it wouldn't be able to wild card, right? Uh, you're thinking of the Peacemaker. Oh, you're right. I was thinking of the Peacemaker. Yeah, sure. which is why I said this is uh, the first time Pathfinders can. Yeah, yeah. In Link, um, which is absolutely huge. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've seen it in Assemblers, right? For and uh, Rafiq. Yeah. But. Um, so let's check out some of these new profiles. Let's do it. New artwork. All right. So, right, so this is the the Blade Ops, Ops the Neo Terran Unified Commando Regiment. Um, you know, all have, I see, yeah. all I see, is sexy Flanders. <laughs> sure. Um, just saying. It's like wearing just nothing saying. at all. Yep, yep. Blade up got cakes. Um, so it looks kind of like a bolt with uh without an antenna. Mm -hmm. And we can see here stats, yeah, gizmo kit, 40 shotgun sure, SMG. Just, just um for which to I mean, it's, to it, medic it people with. Right, it's a cool design in the same way that a lot of Pano stuff looks cool. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, also the very once... samey. It's very what? Well, I mean, it suffers from the same the Pano problem where all the knights look the same. Yeah, um, this does have the one sleeved sweater though to help differentiate it. Mm. Yeah, it's for for catch the it's the armor for catching the boomerang on that side. Oh, yeah, there you go. That's what it is. Oh. Huh. So what's the uh, what are the profiles here? Oh, there's the other art, the the the, the sexy more, art, more different art. Um, yeah. So here's the profile. Let's go through it. Okay. So again, 
this is probably everything that's coming out of my mouth the next 20 seconds is probably a lie because we, we have no idea if these are real or not, but some of these numbers are probably accurate. Um, so it's going to be a specially trained troop for, for the purposes of classifies, which is nice because that means you can't just like do the classified with them. Um, they're light infantry, uh, move 4 4, CC 16, BS 13 because they're Pano, Fizz 10 because they're Pano, Whip 12 because they're Pano, uh, Arm 2, BTS 3, 1 wound, and Silhouette 2, of course. Um, yeah. They have BS Tech Shock, which is quite relevant for dealing with Liberto, who will show up in the <coughs> field. If you're not already dead by turn three, something has gone horribly wrong for you. Uh, but now you can deal with them. Um, they they have immunity to shock, which is less relevant at the bottom of turn three. Uh, but yeah. there you have it. Uh, Mimetism three. But again, these profiles exist, you know, possibly in, in normal infinity too, without the reinforcements. They have stealth because they're commandos. Um, and stealth is kind of hot. Stealth, stealth is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. No. No problems with stealth. Um, yeah, so they've got, uh, it, it looks like they might just add ref to the end of the profile. That's, that's a reinforcement profile, right? That seems like REF sort of different. Yeah. Right? Um, so there's two options of kit. There's boarding shotgun, SMG D charges and gizmo kit. Um, and the latter one is the engineer and the and former one is just the dude. Yeah. Tag is pretty good. So it helps yeah, the swallow it... a lot. It helps the squad a lot. It also really helps the um, the the unit cap in there, right? Yep. yep. So twenty four points gets you the SMG engineer attack aware. That's that's a, a handy little tool. It is a quarter of your hundred points, though. I know, right? Everything's going to be a quarter of your hundred points. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, like I could also see them not allowing like the attack aware being used outside of the reinforcements, right? Like it could just be what they're doing for reinforcements on this guy to make your engineer. Oh, I see. I see. Like so, the the quote unquote regular profile won't have won't have uh, 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 attack aware. Is what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Like a yeah, total possibility. I, I believe that. Uh, and I, you know, I think the attack aware is an interesting design space when you think about it from the perspective of it's not going to be on the table turn one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it makes it a little more. A little less impactful, I guess I should say. Um, yeah, I'm uh, like this profile seems fine. I actually am a little more attracted to the boarding shotgun profile because I mean, yeah, attack wear is is very good, uh, but midfield templates no, really also good. very good. Yeah, I wish I had a combi profile. It, uh, yeah, yeah, it's BS thirteen, take... so it's less of a problem. But yeah, like a BS a BS thirteen mimetism shock combi. I well, it's shock in AP yeah. now, which is nice. Yeah, sure, with the boarding shotgun. No, no, the submachine gun, right? But yeah, the submachine gun, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd probably take a combi. The boarding shotgun's not bad, though. I just... Boarding shotguns on 21-point single wound models always make me a little anxious. Yeah, I mean, it also... I think it's a nice way to deliver um, some much-needed uh, AP for, for Akon as well. Right? Yeah, it's also true. This is giving you the opportunity to put a, to put some AP in the middle of the table. Where, you know, wherever you need it too, like as a reaction to what the enemy has. Yeah, I mean, Akon has Nagas and stuff, but you might lose those early on to, you know, delaying something. So. Yep. Yep. I mean, oh, cool. Not not like a maze balls exciting, but very utilitarian and and good, right? So. Yeah. Uh, nothing nothing really it's, bad to say about it. Well, it's interesting because this is also a profile that I could see totally being passed over outside of reinforcements. Yeah. But in the context of reinforcements, yes, it's interesting. Yes. Okay. Now we're looking at um, blockers. So um, Blocker. this is attached agents of the CDCI. Um, and I'm not sure what that is, but they are uh, full of ADHLs. That's the thing that they yep. have. Um, oh, one last thing to note on that last profile. Yeah. A whip 13 engineer. Whip 12. Oh, never mind. Whip 12. Ha ha. Okay. Well, here we go. Whip 13 hacker. Yep. So um, I'll run down again. Again, specially trained troops, light infantry, 4 4 move, CC 17, BS 12, because they're presumably specialists or agents, Fizz 10, Whip 13, yeah. uh, Arm 1, BTS 3, 1 wound, uh, Silhouette 2. Um, BS Tech like plus Whip 13 first. Fusilier. What's up? It's like a Whip 13 Fusilier. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, with BTS 3, that's relevant. Um, yeah. Plus one, plus one attack. Uh, sorry, plus one burst on BS attacks. Uh, they okay. get sensor, biometric visor, and X visor. 
all of which are very good for their actual um, uh, weapons, which is basically just ADHL, nanopulsor, and multi pistol, right? They have a flash pulse too. Um, but you probably won't be using that in active. Flash pulse doesn't. Because doesn't it's a technical get... weapon, so I don't think it benefits from burst, but I'm not sure. Maybe if Clint, if Clint is on, he can, he can clarify. Yeah, um, I'm going to get that up. I know they don't for link teams, but. Yeah. But, I mean, this is a reasonable way of dealing with enemy heavy infantry, right? You just blop them with double ADHLs. Um, with a two X Pfizer ADHL. Mm-hmm. So you can you can uh, do it from uh, from outside of 16 and, and still expect to be on nines. That's helpful. Yeah. Um, a burst two nanopulsor, a burst mm-hmm. three multi pistol. Yep. These are all these are all good things. You can also try to hold something up in close combat, right? With a pair of CCW yep. minus six. That's a thing that you could do. That's, uh, that's I, good. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think you'll see the 16-point profile. If you see anything, it'll be the half-swick 21-point hacker, right? I mean, here's the reason why I think you will see the cheat profile, because okay. you, only have, you only have 100 points, right? And if you're in the, the granularity of the points in your reinforcements is really low. That's um, fair. That's you, a good point. I didn't, you, I didn't consider that. Yeah, you could very well end up with like 16, 17 points left over. Like, what do you take? But I mean, let's let's think about this, right? This the other profile we just looked at. They, uh, I guess, you, you did have a specialist option. Um, I I think the specialist options are the more relevant ones. Period. The, unless you're playing a kill mission, in sure. which case, absolutely, the sixteen point one is the right choice. Um, right. But I mean, actually, in a kill mission, I wouldn't take either of them because you want to kill stuff. Yeah. And the ADHL doesn't help yeah, you do that. Helping you do that. Uh, it's just it's just you have to spend more orders doing it. So yeah, I mean, I I, I think for uh, objectives mission where you're actually trying to push buttons, I would take the hacker, right? Whip thirteen. Sure. Um, yeah. It you too. Whip thirteen specialist in the midfield right away. Yep. I mean that's that's sort of the thing. Also, it helps you deal with a lot of threats because I mean, like, how often? Because if you're if you're going first, right? This basically lets you get a hacker into a position where the enemy doesn't want it, with zero downside. Yeah. Right. It just happens. Yeah. Interesting. No. Interesting. Yeah. I don't. Know. I'm. I'm still like. I'll have to see what you know how the other points come out. Mm-hmm. But I still could very much see coming up to your list, you know, with 83 points in in your uh, reinforcements. I need one last thing to fill it out. Yeah, so Mr. Steve comes up with an excellent, uh, excellent point, which is you can put it into a, a core Harris or duo with bolts. So in that context, it does go up to a 16-point burst three adhesive launcher, which is good, Ooh. right? Um, so that's burst probably four, that's probably bolt. worth it, and you can take a you can take a bolt specialist. Yeah, I mean a burst four multi pistol is not bad either. Yeah, in midfield that'll be pretty strong. So yeah, I take it back. That's actually a reasonable reasonable thing. I forgot they were linkable. Yep. Weird. Really. The con- the context is so different knowing that it's going to be in the midfield. Yeah, midfield sensor is huge, right? Like I don't I don't I don't think that's like we we sort of glossed over that, but that's massive. Um, yeah. But, you know, like the yeah. like we sort of fixated on the on the on the hacker versus the non-hacker. I mean, I think I think this will see yeah, interesting. most of my um my pano depending on how much uh, how much that uh Swiss Swiss guard is. Um, sure. so there's that new bolt concept, yeah, new, which new bolt looks... concept art, uh, looks similar to the old bolt concept art. Also very beautiful. Uh, yeah, I mean, I love it. It looks great. Uh, new squallow. So this is the Mark two. Um, this is rad. I yeah. love this design. Yeah. It looks really cool. Uh, it's definitely sort of like a, a streamlined squallow design, which is pretty great. Uh, here's a, here's a, the sort of art only dossier, which is really, really nice looking. Oh, with the double multi pistols. Yep, with the double multi pistols, right? Pistolero, Squalo. I hope this is the model they give us. Like the render looks like this. That would be really cool. Like this, like yeah, tall, I want the double. kind of. It gives me big, like, uh, like uh, Sentinel vibes, like the the uh the modern Sentinels from from X Men, right? Oh sure. And I'm a big sucker for that, so that's pretty cool. But I feel like it's just missing some antenna and a coat to be Appleseed, you know. Also true. Also true. So let's look at the profile. Um, so obviously it's a tag. Uh, it's a pano tag, which means it has remote presence. And so it comes with a crab bot. Uh, nothing, nothing particularly surprising there. 
Uh, move 6-4, like all their tags. Uh, um, CC 18, uh, BS and PH 15, whip 12, arm 6, BTS 6, three structure, silhouette 6. Um, uh, has rem presence, has the tag, plus 1 damage. ECM guided, minus 6. Uh, it dodges on 11s. It does get a dodge plus 1, which I don't know if the original Squall has, but I'll have enough to compare. Immunity shot because it's a tag. Uh, Gizmo kits on a 13, and you give tactical wear because it's a tag. Um, yep. The three weapon options are uh, multi marksman for one swick at 57 points, an AP Spitfire with grenade launcher with the additional damage to get up to damage 15, um, one and a half swick and 65, and then just the AP Spitfire, uh, one and a half swick, 63. All of them get a CC weapon and multi pistol plus one burst. Right, so there's a couple interesting things in here. First off, it's the uh, the NCO on the AP Spitfire without the grenade launcher. Oh, so, right. Yeah, I did miss that. Yep. Yep. Combining both NCO and Tackleware. That's very strong. Jim Lee, your lieutenant's still alive, I hope. Yep. And then you could duo it with a Tackleware engineer. Yep. That's a lot of, that's five orders on two models right there. Yeah, but that's like all of the uh, points. It, it is. So that's the other thing. The, the, the multi-marksman is the profile I think is actually going to be pretty hot because it is only one swick. Well, the other thing that you need to pay attention to is that the multi marksman has a minus three in, in eight, within eight, and I think that's actually. Uh, you, well, I, I mean, I guess you have the multi pistol, so I guess it's not that relevant. Yeah, you, you, there you do, go. You do drop to. Uh, yeah, so I, I take that back. It's fine. It's 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 the, it's the briscard solution. Give them assault pistols. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so you cover that range band that the Spitfire goes down to zero at. So it's. Yeah, if you didn't have that multi pistol, it would matter. But the multi pistol is huge there. So you've got a multi pistol and a multi marksman rifle, mm -hmm. which basically means you have these. You have a multi marksman rifle between zero and twenty four inches at plus three. Mm -hmm. um, depending on what the swick cost of other things, being able to shave that extra half swick off and get out to the to the multi marksman, I can see being really desirable. Yeah, you do lose one. Guess, you do lose one burst, but the BS does help with that. So. Yeah, PS15 is huge. Yeah. That's um, all the BS. What do you think about the grenade launcher? I don't know. I've I've been pretty down on grenade launchers since they lost any plus three band. Yeah. But it is damage 15. It is damage 15. And it the does old punch the, right into their deployment zone, too. Yeah, and the old HGL didn't have a plus three zone. So it's not too different. Um. Yeah, I it's. I mean, if you're dropping in with five, you could you could very easily with those two models just dump I guess four orders because the uh, the attack aware of the other guy, yeah, but the four orders worth of heavy grenade shots on nines. Yeah, that's not nothing. That's actually, I mean, the BS fifteen helps that a lot. Yeah, I'm not sure I would squander my my orders doing that though. It depends on how the enemy is set up. One actually really interesting tactic is uh, Silhouette 6 is pretty big. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could literally just body block with this guy. Sure. And right. it is only S6, right? So I wonder if this is kind of the replacement for the Ulan. It is. Sorry, say that one more time. It is only Silhouette 6. So I do wonder if it is a replacement oh. for the Ulan. I see. I see. So we're gonna lose the Ulan, you think, or is it just like in terms? Well, of I think the... they don't they don't produce the model anymore for the Ulan and Tikbalang, but this gives you an S six model that you can proxy in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, it does look a little bit like an Agro Bravo, like Wes is saying. Um, but yeah, I think I think it'd be interesting to uh, use it as a body blocker. That's actually probably the right play, right? If you really need to get to an objective, you just park this dude in the way of your, you know, whatever you you do it with it. And you just roll that thing up behind it after breaking the duo. And then you just yeah. you know, have three or whatever to do stuff. Seems pretty good. Especially know, on the turn more... three, right? Like the other, the other thing that's interesting is I have no idea how difficult it's gonna to be to deploy like potentially five models uh at the top of three. Yeah, in the midfield. Yeah, like that might be really hard. So sucking up all of your points on like one chonker tag um and then you know 
putting one more model down, maybe two more models down next to it. Sounds pretty good. I mean, frankly, I feel like the odds of me running a five man fire team with my with my uh, incredibly low. Like, it's like precisely zero. Yeah, like, like, you, you don't even want to run one in a normal three hundred point list. Like, no, no. Yeah. What? Like, like I, I, oh, I, yeah. Set this up now. Like, okay, well, you go get a coffee. Get me one too. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah <laughs> like, exactly. Right. Like, just go to the Starbucks next door. Make this happen for us. Um, yeah, like, that sounds bad. Like, I was asking Tim for some help designing those tack lists because I was like, kind of stuck. And he sent me one that was, you know, like line Kazakh missile launcher, um, so like some front of Vic stuff. And he was like a full five man. And I was like, Ugh. Ugh. No mm. thanks. But yeah, AP Spitfire is great. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, I, I think I think this opens up a lot of interesting plays uh and different ways to structure your your um reinforcements, and I think this appeals to me. Like there, there is certainly. Uh, I think maybe my first outing might be tackle or engineer in this one of these squalos. Yeah, that's like I said. Like it's such a, a cheap, compact. Yeah. Uh, use orders. of the points. Potentially. Yeah, I mean, so I, I guess what is that? So that that uh, was what twenty four points, right? Yeah. So oh, I mean, that's 60, only ninety points. 87 points, right? Yeah. So we have 13 points left over. Um, what what in that list is, is is 13 points? Agnes might be close. Might be Agnes. Do, depending, I don't know. She's what, 14 now? She might get a discount. I don't know. Right? So right see. Like that's... Yeah, I'm looking at the list now. Yeah, hard to say. Pathfinder? Pathfinder? I mean, if it was Pathfinder engineer person and this thing i'm i'm on board right because pathfinders are about 15 now so i could see them getting like a two point discount for reinforcements because you only have them for one turn yeah agnes is 14 yeah i don't know i don't know interesting it 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 gets i mean honestly they might also be they that also might be intentional (laughs) right they're like nope you if you're if you're going to go for five orders on these two models you're not going to squeeze something else in that last bit of points. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that is, that's scary that we haven't discussed at all is what happens if you drop a bullet oh. here with four orders? <clears throat> right. And you just use those five orders to just, like, delete stuff, and then whatever remains of your primary list finishes the job. That's true. Aaron chimed in saying that uh, if you take the multi-marksman rifle and the tackle warrior engineer, then that 19-point or uh, ADHL guy starts to look pretty good. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I think that's that's going to be super relevant. Yeah. Um, it's just the leftover points. So yeah, this is what we were talking about earlier with the way they're going to do releases. So October, November is when they're going to be releasing the Pan Oceana support pack. Um, and it's going to be a box and a blister. Box. Reinforcement. Box. Reinforcement. Yeah, reinforcement box. Um, so it's going to be a box and a blister. Yeah. Right? So in and the so box, box are, yeah. uh, you get a new, presumably new, uh, bolt Spitfire and Bolt Boarding Shotgun with Drop Airs. You get the Adhesive Launcher guy which is that Aaron was just talking about. Uh, a Blade Ops, with bo- both Blade Ops, right? So the Boarding Shotgun and yep. some machine gun version. And uh, I guess the general release of Agnes because I think she only goes to Defiance right now. Um, and yep. then you'll get the Squallow Blister which is probably going to be in plastic like the uh, the Marut is now. I, I don't know. It's only a six. It's not, but I guess the bear, but the bear is also really fat. I don't know. It, it'll probably be, but they haven't done a blister pack with the plastic model in it yet. Sure, they have. A blister? Yeah, I mean the tournament pack things. I yeah. guess the Marut came in that the um, the Yar. Um, the Zeta. Is that a blister box? I don't yeah, know. I mean, it's it's not a it's not the traditional CB box, right? I I would I would say it's uh, I would say it's blister, and then of course uh, oh. Frank is saying like yep. a, uh, meteors on. Meteors on. Is, uh, so there you go. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, Either that's way, the, that's the thing. All right, we cover on. all the new stuff. Yeah. On on to the the more exciting one because the more Bupano, exciting, Bupano. the corrector one. Yeah. The cor- more correct one is uh, Dayback Force, which is uh, the Koreans for Yujing. So in I here, uh, we've got a. Uh, Sulyong Naval Operations Group, 
uh, we got Jujak, uh, Huarang, Ahete, uh, Sulsa, uh, Zook KB, um, and a bunch of the uh, the remotes. So we got the Weibang, which is the FO bot, the Missile Bot Sombe, Rushi, which is going to be terrifying. Um, yeah, let's drop that in the midfield. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, the two characters, Sora Kwan and Chunky Jong, and that's the uh, the Jujak character, and then the Zanshi engineer character, I believe comes with a repeater, which is also hot in the midfield, right? Yep. Uh, and then Bishi, uh, who is going to be an absolute pain in the ass to remove. Oh, just dropping her in midfield. I think that I think that Bishi is in there just because it's like, so every Yujing player has a reason to, to get her. Yeah. So fire teams, right? We've got Core Harris duo uh, of uh Jujax Harang, which I, I don't know Haring. what Harang are. Uh you get a Harang uh, fire team, which obviously them, the Sulsa, the Heite, and then Bishi. Uh and then wild cards are the Sulyong, uh Weibing, Sombe, uh uh um Dokabi Cyber Team, uh the char- and the two characters. Yeah. So. It's a, it's an, I don't know. I mean, I don't know why they bothered to let Jujax core. I guess you could throw in, throw in the you wild could, cards. Yeah. Waving to bring the price down, I guess. Mm-hmm. Interesting. All seems good. But, yeah, lots of new units, though. What is that? That's one, two, three, four, five, six new units. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. All right, so what's in the uh, okay. these profile? Okay, so we've got the Jujack. We've got the Jujack. There's an MSR in the dossier, which I hope they add. That so, would make me use the period. I don't really before like Before we get too right excited, now. yeah. before we get too excited about the MSR, yes. it was in the original dossier know, as well. I know, I know. But I hope they give it to me because I really want it. Um, yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is basically, I think, the old, even the old one. I don't really I think it's changed Yeah. Um, but they added the stripes. They added the stripes, sure. Uh, hey, the Jujak have always looked really cool, so no, no Yeah, they're there. badass models. Um, this is the Huarang. Right. Okay, so oh. cool design. Yeah, pretty neat. Uh, as a fancy hat. As a fancy hat, right? So big, big uh, K-drama vibes, like the period drama vibes, right? Um, I mean, weapon-wise, this seems a lot like a Tenko. Uh, weapon-wise, it reads more Wu Ming to me, but yeah. Maybe. I guess I feel like I, we may still have to see contenders and Blitzen and stuff like that if it was a Tanko. Yeah. So. Don't know what they do. But they look rad. Right. So here's the here's the here's the profile so we can actually figure out what they do. Um, so they're heavy. So this infantry. profile is wrong. It's wrong. OK. Tell me why. Um, because it was it was a, a copy paste mistake um, from it, from the next profile, it has the exact same identical stat line across the top, mm. um, which was a copy paste error. So we don't know what its stat line is across the top, because otherwise we're saying it's a single wound, one armor, heavy infantry, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, which I think we can all safely assume is probably not correct. Yeah, but I mean, so, this this does feel like. Uh... Pretty Wu Mingy to me, right? Light shotgun, light shotgun, Panzerfaust, cover rifle, and SMG. So this looks like well, link. This uh, looks like link filler. Kind of, but look at the okay. So melee weapon, explosive close combat weapon. Sure. And then the skills seem to be correct. Frenzy MA three is... courage dodge plus two unity shock and stealth. So yeah, that's kind of where I feel like it starts to feel more like a tanko. Like it's fair, it's made. Fair. Made to go punch something in the head with an explosive close combat weapon, and like its ranged weapons are trivial. Um, yeah, that damage, combi, 15, that damage com- fifteen combi rifle is yeah is good. I mean, so it's a Mark eleven, right? <laughs> like, take sure, a, not, sure. not a Mark twelve. Yeah. Um, but I'm really looking at martial arts level three, uh, dodge plus two, and explosive close combat weapon. Yeah, this looks like a tie somebody up or delete them. Yeah, right. this like I, I think the usage model for this is you drop him in, you get him into base to base or something, and then you, you if it's your turn you swing on the way in, and if they somehow survive, you just leave them there, and then you move yeah. on with your I mean, day. <laughs> it's also kind of like a um, like a Teuton, right? 
Yeah. It, it has a gun. It will shoot you with that gun until it's until it's easier to punch you. And they'll probably be at least BS twelve. Yeah, this is also martial arts level three explosive close combat weapon heavy infantry starting with stealth starting in the midfield. Mm-hmm. Right, stealth saves its ass a lot. That gives it a lot more uh, leeway for me. Yeah, and like if this ends up in like say white banner or its own sectorial where it can core with jujacks or something, right? So you roll up with the jujack Spitfire and then you deliver this guy. That's pretty good too. Yeah. For twenty two points, yeah, I, I think it's a pretty solid, yeah, yeah, pretty solid unit. I would, I would, I will use this for sure. Um, then we have salsa, which have a dope hat. Um, I can't not know. think salsa every time I see that. <laughs> yeah, and so the hat to me is just—it's just missing the chips. It should oh, just God. be like, <laughs> it should just be like one of one of those like chip hats that has the salsa container in the middle. Sure, yeah. Are you volunteering to wear that at the next RCGO? Event. <laughs> no. I volunteer nothing. Okay, um, fair enough. Um, so here's the profile. So and... this is this seems to be the correct stat line for this model. Okay. So this is an elite troop, which means you can do some classifieds with it. Although we're, we're supposedly getting new classifieds at some point. So a move for okay. light infantry, four four move, CC twenty three, BS eleven, Fizz thirteen, whip thirteen, arm one, BTS three, one wound, S two. Uh, skills again. I'm a three courage dodge plus three dodge plus two inches. Mimetism minus six and stealth. So we have ODD, which is pretty rad. Um, and they come with ODD very close dodging, yeah. dodging four inches on sixteens. Yeah. So this seems like a budget Shikami. It's absolutely a budget Shikami. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, well, run, run out with weapons. Yeah. Cole's Cole's volunteering to wear the hat. There we go. Perfect. All right. So yeah, boarding shotgun shock mines. But only AP CC weapon. Okay. I mean, that's honestly fine. You're pretty likely to crit. Sure. Right? Uh, the six. shock mines is really weird on there. Um, or you can so. trade the shock you can trade the shock mines for a DA. I mean I, I'm not saying that the shock mines are bad. I'm just saying that they're weird. Like I can't there's not another midfield mid negative six close combat thing that's also like, oh, and some mines because sure, I guess Yojimbo's kind of like that. But I mean, I, I see this as a as a nice a nice thing, right? So no, it's fantastic. I yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm almost willing to give up the uh, the um, uh, the DA weapon for this because he, here's here's a here's a uh, I'll paint you a picture. There's a there's a link team on the other side of uh, some cover, right? And you're moving up on this team. So what you do is first thing is you move, you drop a mine. You roar on the corner into the base to base or something, and then the rest of the team is forced to dodge the mine and not shoot you. Right? Yeah. And I, I don't think it's, I don't like, like, well, like Wes is saying, right? I don't think it's a question of whether you want to do this or do the corner mine trick. I think you get to do both. You corner mine yeah. and then CC, right? Well, what's going to happen is you're going to corner mine, you're going to walk around the corner into CC, right? Ask them what they do, right? Yeah. And then the mine goes off and you double shotgun the group. Right, or the mine goes off and you CC the one guy, turn the dodge away. Right, right. right like right. it's it's bad news everywhere. Um, it's a really rad profile. Yeah. And then they have a regular hacking device option with an SMG. Mm-hmm. Or it is it is a zero, zero SWIC, SWIC which is relevant. That's probably Especially a mistake. You only have two two SWIC in the uh, yeah. in a group, and then a Ford Observer with SMG mines. This is the profile. Yeah. This is the profile. Okay, so it's a fort, it's a specialist, right? Yeah. It's it's the it's cheaper than the shotgun profile. Yep. Okay. It comes with mines, flashballs because it's a fort observer, and it retains the DA. It retains the DA. Yeah, retains the DA, retains the mines, is a specialist. You don't get to do the shotgun templates, but you've got mines. Sure. That's a rad profile. The other thing is if you go for if you're going first. I mean, this does this does help uh, the the first turn player secure an area, right? Mim six and in suppression sounds gross. Yeah, that's a that's a toolkit. Yeah, I like this. I like that profile a lot. And yeah, it's in suppression. What do you do? Template it and it'll dodge four inches into close combat with you on sixteens? No. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Don't want wrong, yep. <laughs> wrong answer. Yeah. So well, the da is your face off. I wonder I mean, if I wonder if they're like seeing these profiles. I wonder if they're positioning the Korean 
like uh, the hypothetical future Korean sectorial as the replacement for JSA within UJIC. This, I mean, so far the profiles feel like the replacement for JSA. Yeah, UJIC, yeah, right. And and like, to be clear, we as workers have heard nothing to this effect. This is purely speculation. Yeah. Um. And that's not a one-to-one replacement. No, and I wouldn't want it to be, right? Because then you might as well just bring JSA back into the fold. We we made a mistake. Come back. But there's there's some conceptual overlap without being the same. Yeah. I like that Ford Observer is a is a jerk. Yeah, starting in the midfield. Yeah. Right? Like that's a jerk. Yeah, and like uh like Tanaka Scholar was saying, right? Like the Koreans are are pretty much door 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 kickers. Uh so then we have the Sulyong. Right, which I keep wanting to. It makes me hungry because I like Sir Um oh, right. <laughs> but Anyway, yeah, that's uh, some cream. That sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's oh, it's great. I actually found a really nice cream place near me. We should go. Um, it's been around since I moved here, but like they've gone through a bunch of different changes in ownership, and now they're actually very good. Um, huh. So yeah, we'll have to we'll have to go sometime. Um, but yeah, so this looks like kind of a. a, a a uh, jack of all trades kind of profile comes with a uh, red fury shock marksman, which is overlapping a lot. Uh, light shock and submachine gun um, dossier. Um, the actual profile though is a veteran troop, right? So again, relevant for classifieds, assuming that sort of stuff is still relevant. Uh, they're mm-hmm. medium infantry, right? So we should spec higher arm and BTS, and we do get that arm BTS three for both. Uh, move four four, uh, CC seventeen, BS twelve, Fizz eleven. Whip 13, one wound because they're medium infantry and S2. Um, skills, native NCO, terrain total, and MSU1. So this is kind of like a, a wild caddy profile. right? I mean, all of them having NCO and MSV1 is a, that's a, I mean, again, it's another nice toolkit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you are picking between the Shock Marksman and the Red Fury. I mean, I don't Red... think, I that that's so expensive. One and a yeah, half you, swick and a two swick. That's what I was just going to get to. Like that. Yeah. Out of out of your two, out of your two swig. No, thank you. You're gonna spend one and a half of them on a red fury? No. <laughs> so Shock you know, legally oh, distinct oh. high down. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, you're gonna take that shock marksman rifle if you want the if yeah. you want the firepower. Yeah, yeah. And I guess I mean maybe they're they're costing the swig based off of the fact that it is a MSV model that you are deploying reactively and put setting up in the midfield. Mm-hmm. But um, I think if you want to gun, you're going for the shock marksman. But we also have the the Ford Observer with a plus one burst boarding shotgun. Were these linkable? Could that get a burst four boarding shotgun in the midfield? I, I believe so. Um, and then uh, it is a wild card. So yes. <laughs> so there's your burst four boarding shotgun in the midfield. Oh, um, which also has a flash full shock mines decharges yep. for twenty four points. That's again another really good toolkit. I feel like that's the one because even even that's at, a... uh, even outside of eight, right? I'm happy to take burst four on nines with AP. Right. That seems fine. I'm okay with that. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, right. Forget the red fury. Damage fourteen AP every day, please. Yeah, and then I mean, you know, the paramedic exists, but I think it's it is definitely sidelined next to a burst four boarding shot. Yeah, uh, but it has all four. the things that you need, right? It's got decharges, it's got mines, it's got crazy template power. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That is, I mean, it's a, it, I like these toolkit profiles. I mean, you and I are both big fans of toolkits, I think, in general. Yeah. We like, we like a model that can do like five different jobs at the same time. Yeah. Um, and this does in this sure. model. I mean, like this model in a link with the uh, with the salsa warrior or whatever was sal- the salsa guy. Um, yes, <laughs> that also has like that crazy toolkit. I think they're also linkable. Like, that's pretty mean. Yeah. Oh, I dig it. So yeah, this is what we know so far. Um, we're finding out more tomorrow. I think Ariadna is happening tomorrow. I'm excited about that. I want to know what's happening to my Merovingia. Right. Well, so at the very least, because we have this book, we know what the other groups are and what they're called, right? Um, and and some of the units that are in them. Yep. So uh, we've gone through Pan Oceana, which is Code Capital, Neo Terra, and totally not NCA. But with those new models coming out, you could actually now build an NCA force again, mm-hmm. right? You're really just missing the bolts. I guess you're also missing the, um, uh, not Auxilia, what are they called? 
Is it Exilia? No, the yeah, guys Exilia the, are out of print. Yep. Yeah, the Exilia. But the bolts help fill a big gap in actually playing NCA today. Um, yeah. I also assume all of the other models that are available in the reinforcements are going to become available again on the store if they've been discontinued, right? Well, I mean, we might get new sculpture and they might come out in the yeah, packs. Yeah, come out in the future. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've seen Code Capital and the uh, dieback mm -hmm. uh, force. And then so Ariadna, you, as they leaked early, is the uh, Le Kip Argent, which is the Merovingia. Um, and the units that they listed, at the very least in the book, covered uh, essentially everything um, for Merovingia that has been discontinued, right? So, um, actually, I guess they didn't list Metros, but let me pull it up really quick. So, in the Merovingia list, they uh, referenced um, uh, Les Apaches, mm -hmm. Les Apaches, Lugru, Briscards, Mabalo, Chasseurs, and Bruant. Yep. So, I'm super happy to get a new Bruant sculpt. Yeah, it's um, hard to find these days. Chasseurs as well. You want the old one? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, Lugaru and Briscards in the middle sound fantastic. That's where I want Lugaru. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, an x Pfizer viral rifle. Also, here's, sure. here's the thing that I've been working on, right? I'm I'm sure Lugaru, because they're linkable in vanilla, I'm sorry, in, in normal Merovingia will also be linkable here. Linkable here. Yeah. One of the things that I've been trying to play with is because they're x Pfizer, you can actually punch out for quite a distance on nines. Right. Yeah. To They're drop to drop a pair of grenades, because they have a grenade uh -huh. launcher profile, which is actually pretty relevant. So if they retain that, that means I'm punching um, grenades out into your deployment zone. If you have, if you, I can like maybe clip something, and uh, sure, because like one of the things that I've done twice now, now to, first to Frank and then to Eric, is you know dealing with the Sphinx and dealing with the anathematic is a pain in the ass. Much less so if you have a template, an impact template, and there's a Taiga standing next to said camo token. Right. Yep. So uh, I managed to bounce an EM grenade off of a Taiga and and nail a Sphinx, and I did the same thing with an HRL from uh, from a um, Stigmata on Eric's Anathematic. And so mm. in the in near the end of the game, um, positioning like kerfuffles running out of orders might mean that you have orders to move the Taiga out of the way or recamo and like or X or recamo yeah. right. And so so like being able to bounce grenades off stuff. Especially if you have a zoning team that's kind of like clustered up, might actually be pretty pretty helpful. So not bad. Um, and yeah, something I do want to mention in the the units that I'm going to mention, these yeah. aren't necessarily an exhaustive list of all the units. Right. These are just the units that are in the book that have new fluff. Mm -hmm. um, if this was the exhaustive list, then like you know, Pano only got five things, right? But like we saw that list, and it's way bigger. So. Yep. Um, I assume there'll be more. Well, to I wonder if this means you can, like, you're going to be able to drop like tractor mules in the midfield. God. <laughs> just Crash. like, just like, just like take up space. Excuse me, pardon it's, me. Excuse me, pardon it, me. Resupply mission here. Yeah, it deploys unconscious. It just crashes. Um, Pretty much. So, uh, so Great that's what we know for our hundred points, though. Right. I mean, we can probably also assume that like Shasurs will be in there and the pair of commandos. Those bad new sculpts. Yeah. Uh, maybe some generic things, 112, dozers, uh, et cetera. Um, yeah, maybe some of the uh, like Stranic Outer Patrol, like maybe some of those random space dudes. Who knows? We'll find out tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, um, Islam is the uh, Melek reaction group, which is definitely an offshoot of uh, Kapu Kalki. So it has the Corson Corsairs of the Gate, the Burkut Aerospace Engineering Regiment. Um, and then the ones that we already know, uh, Havza, Odalesks, Sekban, Azrael, and Alhawa. Mm -hmm. um, so that's awesome. Havza have really old sculpts. They could use it. Uh, I think Sekban look rad, but they're just small. So yeah. getting new updated versions of those. Um, I bet they're just going to reprint the Azrael. I would be surprised if they re-sculpted it. It's a pretty recent sculpt, and it looks... Yeah. Hot. Um, and then all hollow are almost certainly going to be news calls. Yeah, to answer Cole's question in chat, in theory, the reinforcement list can be full army, right? Full, full army, right? What you've been told is just what's in the boxes. Um, so These aren't even just in the boxes. These are just what is listed, or yeah. this is just what's listed out as, as lore. 
<laughs> well, so so what? Yeah, what we're reading from now is the stuff that Adam found perusing the book. Um, it's yeah. so you you'll see like later as we get through some other stuff. There's just like one entry, and obviously that's that's not the case, right? Like it's not going to be just that one thing in reinforcements. And looking at just um, Pano right from the book, it says bolts, blade ops, blockers, squalo, and Agnes. And we know that there's a bunch more stuff in there like Aquila, Swiss. Uh, all the robots. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. So, so uh, um, the stuff that's in the book is not necessarily the full reinforcements list. Furthermore, the reinforcements are not a new sectorial. Um, obviously, you could make a list out of it, um, but I don't. I imagine none of them will have lieutenant profiles, right? Because they're reinforcements. You're yeah, probably not. Out. So it won't be a legal list. Um, but I think the most likely contender for, um, like, like, I guess, I guess the most likely model. Of, in my mind, for CB to follow would be uh, for our uh, keep our gent right, like the Merovingian thing. That will slowly get developed into a reboot of the Merovingian sectorial as a whole. You'll probably lose access to some stuff in the reinforcements and gain access to new stuff um, that won't be in reinforcements. That will be a new sectorial. Same for uh, what they do with uh, Code Capital for the NCA stuff, um, and then the Yujing um, Debek Force will probably just become its own Korean themed sectorial. Um, in yeah. my in my mind, uh, Carlos didn't confirm it. He didn't deny it. Um, but that's a a big list of of new things that we haven't yeah. seen before, and that are all very thematically related. So it would make sense to do that. Yeah, um, yeah. So the Malek is great because with all those, you know, it's getting resculpted. You you could play QK quite happily. Yep. Um, so the the Nomad group. Um, it's called the Vipera Pursuit Force. They did not seem to be based off of any one specific um, ship. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of cool. Uh, the units that were mentioned, so basically the new units that were given new lore is what, what these kind of seem to be. Yep. Were Rounders Casino Security, which I just love the idea of <laughs> Casino Security. Yeah, I think that's very funny. Um, just like terrible, the, terrible stat lines, <laughs> right? Um, and then the uh, the Kulak Retribution Unit, yep. uh, Lizard Squadrons. So Lizard Resculpting coming. I'm, I'm. Um, and then the Red Sky Mars Spiders. If they don't have Climbing Plus, I will be very disappointed. If Spider in the name, but I gotta climb. Yeah. Um. So for combined, we knew that it was the uh, the extra commissariat. Yep. Right, and that's going to have uh, base op or base operators, vector operators, void operators, um, X raw executive officers, Cascuda, and Nexus operatives, mm -hmm. plus other stuff. But at least those were given new lore, so maybe some more Nexus sculpts. I think they only came out with like one Nexus sculpt, and it was the one profile that nobody wanted to use. Yeah. Um, so now we're getting more. So, yeah. Uh, for O twelve, and this actually, I bet. O12 loses the robot from vanilla uh, because the O12 Gladius team includes the robots. And remember, they added them to vanilla because everyone was like, you said that all O12 armies can use this. So I pre-ordered seven of them. Um, yep. So the uh, the robots appear in there, the Sarko, um, the Secu droids, which the artwork for the Secu droid is actually pretty badass. I'm going to I'm going to find it really quick. Um, Nightshade's clandestine unit. So there was Vidoc, an artwork. Uh, yeah, this, while you find it, there's a Vidoc multi-purpose security brigade, the Jack uh, Jack Boots armed presence, which is <laughs> little little right nail right on the head, and then uh, a Ment agents professional standards investigation department. So, Ooh, I thought I had the. Uh... Nope, never mind. I didn't have that page marked. So you'll just have to wait and see. But. The uh, the nightshades clandestine unit are um, the uh, the cool ninja that everyone was like, that's a Toha. And I'm like, why would you think that's a Toha? Apparently, it is basically a ninja clan that has started to work with the cops. Yeah, well, that's fun. Um, right? Yeah, we don't know anything about them. I'm sure we'll learn more about them this week. Uh, then for Alif, we've got Rickshaw with no W. So the Alif group is called Program, uh, Program Ank or Ankh. Oh, A N K H. Yeah, uh, just A N K. Oh, okay. Um, Rickshaw Techbots, Don Techbots, a Satra unit, 
our tallest unit, and then of course Maximus. I Maximus is such a rad model. Yeah, it's gonna be fun to play him. Um, I don't know if he's any good on the table, but he's gonna see the table because he's rad. Right. So the the NA two uh, the NA two bit was pretty rad because it's called the contracted backup, mm-hmm. and basically the the page of lore that they have for them is a sales pitch. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's like, awesome. Hire us. Um, uh, they missed the golden th- opportunity to include your character, Mr. Yokoso. Oh, yeah, exactly. Right. Um, should have been in there. Yeah. Oh, well. But um, yeah, so the contracted backup, the, there's the only new unit that seems to be in there. So I'm going to guess it's going to be a smattering of other existing um, mercenary units. But it, is, it seems like it, brawlers are an auto include into that list. I hope not brawlers. We'll see. We'll see. It's, it's I, you know, they could get creative with it, right? Maybe it's like Chaxa Long Arms or something really silly. Shut up. Shut your mouth. <laughs> it's going to be that, right? <laughs> but they just discontinued Long Arms. It's not I know, it's gonna, that, that's why it's perfect. Yeah, so they can repack them into six pack of models. Perfect. Yes. Three of them will be Chaxa Long Arms. <laughs> or a Billy Mays character. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, what was so, that? He kept selling like the. the, the, the cloth thing shamwow shamwow that's it uh different sh- different guy than the shamwow guy okay all right fair enough but or i might think of this laptop guy you might have done shamwow anyways uh, um yeah so uh the the one new bit of lore that they have though is for independent operator samsa who is basically an extra uh who has l- fled the combined army um to go you know uh, seek out on its own and then last but not least, Toha. Okay, so oh fire. People still have those, huh? Firecrackers. Okay, so the Toha, uh, the Daros car, Toha words that make sense to Toha, um, will include the Rasail boarding team, the Kosul Assault Pioneers, and Nima Sitar. Those all three got new lore. But I think the big important thing here is that Toha got new lore. Right, like they're they haven't been eliminated and forgotten. They weren't like phoned. You know, they they weren't just like given some army entries to have it, and they just never talked about it. Um, and reading, I did read a bit of their background, and they definitely did make the whole um, alias gate thing not sound like the end of the world for the Toha. It basically sounded like they they shut the gate to prevent the combine from coming that way, and they're establishing new supply lines. They won't lead the to- they won't lead the combine directly back to their home world. Oh, that seems that seems like a reasonable thing to have done, right? So it's like like it's basically like a lore wise to 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 give CB like a pause, I guess, on them. Yeah, but not that makes sense. But like they they really easily could have just not put them in the book at all, right? They could have easily been totally ignored. Um, you know them mentioning even mentioning these units makes me wonder like if they're going to bring some of them back in production all the units talked about are newer sculpts so like maybe and then they just discontinued the spiral stuff so maybe there is some sort of repackaging occurring soon i don't know totally hypothetical um yeah we have no idea it seems it seems plausible i don't know but that's uh that's what we have for end song. Well, very cool. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. We, we get the whole rest of the week to find out what cool stuff is waiting for us. Um, yeah, I I actually am pretty excited to try it out. Uh, I don't know if we can. We I don't know if we know enough to try it out this Thursday at game night. Um, Not really. Maybe, maybe the fall because we, you know we need the the point cost for everything and all that. So. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as soon as we get the army stuff, I'm gonna. I'm going to play it. I'm gonna I'm, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I know, like, I feel like some people are going to dismiss it as, like, just an ITS extra, like, Spec Ops, but It's, it's I, significantly more disruptive than Spec Ops, though. It, it, it's also significantly more interesting, I think, and more balanced, right? It's still locked into points at the end of the day. It's not like, yeah. you know, it's, it's not like the difference between, like, cool, I'm playing Caledonia, so I get a volunteer to make my Spec Ops from. Oh, yeah, or I get a Muyib or something. Yeah, and you're playing Hakka's on me to get a Muyib, and it's, like, yeah. neat. This is where we both get 12 points, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. 
no, I, I, I think it'll open up a lot more interesting avenues of play, but it, I, I'm just concerned that um, it might make a blowout worse. Maybe. Yeah, I'm really curious. But again, we can also solve that with our custom missions and our uh, reinforcement suitability metric. Sure. Sure. <laughs> sure. All right, John. So now on to our, our second topic for the evening, which is uh, double your pleasure, double your fun. Um, John has been playing two games or more. Is that true? Simultaneously? I think the most I've ever done is two. Okay. Uh, I'm willing to try three, but not at a tournament yet. Okay, there you go. There you go. So so what what is this nonsense uh, that you were doing, Mr. Not Wise Kensai, but now Foolish Ashigaru? Right. So um, I actually haven't played under the ITS yet. I, I borrowed. Okay. Um, that's, that's new as of like two days ago. But basically the premise is um, I started playing multiple games at once during game night. Um, entirely because uh, I was at a game night once and there was an odd number of players and I didn't want, I was really excited about playing. I didn't want to sit out uh, and I didn't want to make anybody else there sit out. So I offered to play two people at once and they agreed because they thought it would be funny. And I actually had a really awesome time doing it. Um, actually, I think the, the very, that was the first time I did it with infinity. The very first time I tried it, I played heavy gear against you. I played a, an infinity game. Um, at the same time, uh, and that was because uh, you you were running a little late, and uh, and and Nathan was looking for an opponent, and it was like just the two of us. So we were like, ah, screw it. Well, when Adam gets here, we'll, I'll play heavy Gary versus him. Um, sure, I remember that. Yeah, and then and then I think the first time I did it for Infinity, both games was that uh, uh, Gong Guy game night where uh, it was like me, Than, Jordan, and uh, Nate and Eric, and I ended up playing Than and Eric at the same time. Um, so if you actually want to see my games, I tag them as multi-game on mercurycon.net, so you can see the, how I did on all those. Uh, there's actually a fair number now, because I've been doing it at game night pretty regularly. Uh, again, mostly to help solve the odd number of players problem. Um, and then there was one time I jokingly offered to do it at Shiv, uh, and you never joke about anything with Jeff that you aren't plan uh, are you, you are not prepared <laughs> to commit to. Um, and sure enough, we had an odd number of players. And so I ended up playing, um, I was Nomads was my secondary army. I forget what my primary army was now. It's been a while. Uh, it might have been Aleph. But anyway, um, yeah. So so that's uh, that's the thing that's happened now twice at tournaments. I offered it to Jeff. And out of you know professional courtesy, I offered it to Pete up at Mindtaker. And he took me up on it last, uh, last Saturday. Um, so I did it. Uh, it is it is actually really awesome. Uh, I the the only downside I would say is that it can lead to um, a negative play experience for my opponents because they have to wait for me and they have to get my attention when they want to like move some stuff or like you know take a shot at something. It's the most disruptive when like for example this last this last tournament it was like uh, you know Achilles was shooting at a tag um, and so it took it took a couple orders to get chew through like all the wounds of the tag and so I had to. I had to sit there and roll for the tag for my opponent my uh, versus my opponent's Achilles, um, while the other guy was just like sitting there twiddling his thumbs, waiting for waiting for me to respond to his 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 move with the arrows. Um, so uh, the Cole's joking about when is the fifteen people versus John tournament. Uh, so I am so I am thinking about options for whatever the next RCGO thing is that replaces RCR. So one of the options is going to be um, a uh, uh, the Ariadna Mega Table event. Uh, still very much up in the air about what we're planning on doing there for, for to like completely seal the deal. Uh, but it will be all it'll be at least four tables. You have to fight from one side to the other like linearly, um, and there'll be like somebody playing Merovingi uh, Merovingi or, or Vanilla Ariadna or something to sort of stop you as a, as the GM or DM versus player characters. Um, and I have this kind of idea for uh, for an order metric where um, you, uh, as the player characters, can buy benefits by giving the GM's orders to spend, right? And that's how the GM will refill their order pool 
It will not be generated by the number of models the GM has on the table. And so things like rerolls or guided missile strikes or reinforcements uh, will cost orders that you hand to the GM, right? So it gives you this like little push-pull dynamic that keeps everything trucking along. Uh, and it, it helps you get across four tables, right? Because Infinity is so lethal that it might be relevant to reroll um, fizz saves or whip saves on doctoring or paramedic some, something back up, right? Um, mm -hmm. Especially if it's like a lot of points or we're getting reinforcements and stuff. So I, I have a lot of helipads on that. So I was thinking about like, you have to secure the helipad and that's that's where reinforcements show up and so on. But anyway, that's a, that's a topic for another, another time. The other thing, of course, is just like a, a normal tournament. And then I was also thinking about using this reinforcements thing as a team tournament um, where you show up and then your reinforcements, like it's two versus two, basically on two different tables. Uh, you you play the game normally and then your reinforcements show up on your teammates table and vice versa. And you have to pilot them on your on your teammates table and interleave orders or something. It'll be probably kind of interesting. Lots and lots of complexity there. Um, the last thing that I wanted to do is for charity, you can buy a ticket to play me and you... If you want me to play a list that you made, you have to bring the models because I, I, I just can't source all the models myself. I don't own some armies, for example. Um, but I will play whatever you give me to play, and I will, I will, I will fight you. And if you walk up and there's a table, table open, and we can, you know, we can play on it. I will, I will play as many people as physically possible. Uh, and you, you buy a ticket, and the money will go to charity uh, for RCGO or something like that. So that's that's something that uh, uh, I am anticipating on doing. Yeah, but you know, like like Jeff. Right, it is dangerous to suggest things to me as a joke because I I might execute on them, um, not as not as reliably as Jeff, but uh, it is it is possible. Um, yeah, so going back to the two person tournament thing, uh, or two player tournament thing, uh, the only downside is that it might suck for my opponent because they have to wait. I will say that I've done it at two tournaments now, and I finished all um, all eleven games before time was called. And I say 11 because when I did it at Shiv, I ended up having to play myself. Um, so <laughs> Jeff ended up playing round three against me because I was using his ITS uh, for the second player. That's use the TO. Um, so it wasn't a full 12 games. It was only, it was only 11. Um, yeah, super, super enjoyed it. It is not for everyone, obviously. Uh, it, is, it is incredibly mentally taxing. Uh, but I think it exposes, like, it's an incredible training tool for several reasons. Um, one is that, you know, everybody who's a parent understands how little time you have after kids. And so mm -hmm. compressing two games into the time period you can play one game into is very helpful. Because one of the things that, uh, one of the problems that we all have, we have multiple armies, is like, I really want to play JSA, but I am currently prepping for Aleph to bring to a tournament or something, right? So I'm playing the tournament missions that they left. I'm really eyeing my, you know, tomorrow I want to go Kung Fu somebody in half. Um, and uh, I can't do that because I'm only playing one game on game night and the tournament's on Saturday, right? But now I can play two games. I can play my 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 for funsies list and my, my serious tournament list uh, against two players um, and, uh, and, and have a good time and try out different strategies, learn new things. Um, it allows you also to iterate on stuff really quickly as well, because you sure. can play two to the same game twice. It might, this is the, like the same argument we make for new players going to tournaments. People are like, oh, I don't want to go to tournaments. I don't know what I'm doing yet. I feel very uncomfortable. And, you know, I, I need to get some more experience. Well, tournament is exactly where you should get that experience because you get three games in a day. You have a lot of people who are, share the same interests, are willing to talk about the hobby, are willing to give pointers and feedback and uh, give you a sounding board. Right. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, you know, a place to get three reps in very quickly and, and gain a lot of experience with a particular set of missions and, and against a variety of different factions which you may not play. And so this is the same argument, right? It's a time compression thing on one end. And the other thing is that also increases the cognitive load. Um, and that I think makes, has made me a better player. Um, like I was just, I was just talking about my, my loss against Eric um, this last tournament. Uh, and, you know, it was uh, Uplink Center, which is baby acquisition, for those of you who don't know, uh, where you have to, like, end up physically touching a center console uh, at the end if you've never played it, either of those. Um, and he deployed a Speculo and a Caliban, like, sitting next to the center console, and it was, like, on the second story of a building, right? And I was like, how are you going to, like, what am I going to do about this? My mm -hmm. options for getting there, I was playing a double tag list. The tag physically won't fit up there. 
Like it's one of those, it's the uh, CB cardboard terrain. So like the tag is too fat sure. to climb it. Right. So I can't, I can't even get up there and park there if I wanted to. Um, so I was like, what do I do? My option is like Zoe, right? <laughs> and like Zoe is not really going to fight a Speculo and a Caliban. Right. <laughs> and so I just sort of gave up. Right. And so um, I was thinking about it. I was like, ah, forget it. I can't do it. Uh, and I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to outpoint him and figure it out the other way. So my, my strategy was drive the both tags so far up Eric's ass that he would have to like deal with them and not be able to do anything. Right. And that sort of worked, but the, uh, the anathematic, anathematic just like didn't die <laughs> after getting hit by a million flame templates. And I was like, all right, well, fine. What I should have done, because at, at the end of the game, it was, as an act of desperation, I threw Zoe onto the, onto the second story and I was like, all right, we're going to discover this Caliban. I mean, sorry, this Speculo. And she's with 15, which goes to 18 when she's close. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm rolling on 12s for the first one and then on 18s for the second one. Right. So I was like, yeah. okay, I'm going to do it. And he's like, Speculo does nothing, which is the right choice for the first layer of impersonation. Sure. I pass on a five and then another order, discover shoot. And he's like, well, who? And I, I took the Zoe with boarding shotgun, right? Which I think is the right profile for these sure. sorts of things. And he was like, ah, uh, I, 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 I slug mode you. And I'm like, okay. And he rolled like a, like a 19 or something. And then I just like rolled two eights and killed the, killed the speculo. But I couldn't get, I couldn't do like, that's pretty lucky. <laughs> and then, and then mm -hmm. also have to kill a Caliban after that in a row. Cause they ran out of orders. Uh, is is just not going to happen. Like the Caliban will absolutely obliterate Zoe if it's its active turn, and that's exactly what happened. So, oh well. Um, and what, what I, was, I was I was telling Eric afterwards, I was too busy trying to pilot a attack list on a neighboring table, which is incredibly complicated because it had 15 camo tokens, right? So I'm like struggling with that. And um, I mean, you made it a little bit easier for yourself you doing a double tag list for the second one, you know, for your your sure, other game. Sure, sure, sure. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but, uh, so I was, I was busy, like remembering which of the 15 camo tokens was a real Strelok, right? And so <laughs> I didn't really have a coherent, I, I also like, uh, when you're, when you're dealing with that much stimulus and cognitive load, you have to cut stuff, right? Sure. So I, I gave up on solving what I thought was a difficult problem. And later on, I was like, damn it. All I had, cause I had first turn, they both took second turn against me. They deployed first and went second in in uplink center, which is the right choice. Uh, you always go second if you can. Um, and what I should have done was just left the tags where they were because the big threat was going to be the end of thematic um, and an overdrawn. And I had two Sin Eaters on the table. And then I was just like a bunch of Taiga and Gaki and stuff. And like the tags are going to be fine. They'll just like, they, they're not going to die to a bunch of warbands. They might get tied up, but I can just triangulate and fire them with Pywell. And like, that's not going to hurt the tag. So it's fine. Um, and uh yeah so i should have just i should have just committed on the first turn and rolled in zoe to do the trick and killed both the speculo and the caliban taken the thing and been queen of the hill right uh with the two mm -hmm. of them and then on turn two after like sort of this anemic kind of like what do i do about this uh trying to do you know answer all these different threats from eric right i'm not saying that his play style is anemic but like in that situation it's very difficult to do something about something on a hill which you don't have any things to deal with and then you have the other the other nut to crack is double sin eater double double stigmata right like well, how do you crack that with one anathematic and uh, one overdrawn hrl right like you can do it but that's your whole turn and then i yeah. still win the scenario because i probably have killed at least one of those things um so so i i think that was a much better play and because i was so distracted piloting the tack list i didn't give myself the room to do that and personally for me that's my my current sticking point in my infinity development, mm -hmm. right? If I if I'm hydrated, caffeinated, rested, full mental faculties, looking at a thing, I can come up with these solutions, right? I can I can give my I can have the emotional um, control and allowance and permission to like take a beat and do these things if I'm focused on one game, right? And for me, I don't always do that when I'm playing one game. Um, I have a, I have a hard I time see. doing that even if I have I'm only you know one opponent. And so doing it in this scenario where I'm intentionally pushing myself to the point of failure, right? You hear about people training like for, for very serious things, um, like, you know, um, uh, like something very physical, like you're, you're, you're preparing for like a big race or something or like, yeah. uh, like a weightlifting thing. You push yourself to the point of failure, right? That's how you improve. 
you're not you're not sure. training to a point where you're consistently consistently doing well, right? You're putting mm. you're training yourself to the point where you fail so you can learn from the failure and give you more opportunities to fail and learn from your mistakes. That's what I'm doing with the double game, right? I'm pushing myself past my ability to handle the cognitive load so I so I eventually rise to the challenge and be able to do that. And so um, that's why I do it. Uh, does that make sense? <laughs> long yeah, long no. Long. It's, um, you know, well, I mean, like you mentioned, you, you learn more from your failures than your successes. Yeah. So you're, you are, you're in a way stressing yourself to fail more. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and there are certain things that I do to make it sane for myself. Um, one of the most recent things that I did was I purchased uh, one of those like order thingies from Microsoft Studios, um, the command panel, whatever they're called. Um, but I put in a special order to make it double sided. So this is actually the same, the same order panel, it's just both sides, right? And I also oh, asked them if they could right. remove. I could also ask them if they could remove like the little red because I don't know. The, I call this a green light art, and there was like a red light art in the other spot, and I just wanted it to be blank because looking at other people's order tracker thingies like the normal one which has like the big open area on the other side so you can put like your prone tokens and unconscious tokens and stuff um i really like my 25 mil uh uh um uh like uh bottle cap sticker tokens for prone and stuff because they're easy to read and visually distinct and the small ones for micro studio are too small for me to distinguish especially because some of them are just like yellow circles and like the difference between like the yellow circle for prone and yellow circle for unconscious is like difficult to parse at like four feet away, right? Mm -hmm. But like mm -hmm. a big inch wide token is easier for me to see. Um, and so uh, the, the same reason I also don't like the red, you know, light thing to show that you've spent the order or the command token or whatever, because it's too visually cluttering, especially because it, then it looks like an impetuous order to me when you're just glancing at it. So I try to like give myself some, um, some, you know, like declutter the visual space a little bit. And so I asked them to remove the red light and they, they were gracious enough to do it. Um, so this was absolutely critical uh, to my game. Fantastic play aid. Uh, I wish I had done this earlier. Um, I really like my, I have all the, the limited edition, like little metal token things from the ITS packs over the years. I love those. They're great. In a casual game, I'll probably still use them. But uh, this is a fantastic tool. I, I absolutely love it. And even if you're not a crazy person like me and you want you don't want to play two games, it's absolutely worth getting one. And we're not sponsored by them or anything. I'm just like really excited about this because when you go to a tournament, there's just so much shit going on. You're freaking out. You're tired, right? You you, you, need, you need to drink more water. Um, and then you like fumble. I've I, in the last two tournaments, I've dropped my token tray twice now, and it sucks. Um, so like not having sure. to do that is amazing. Because what you can do before you go to the tournament, you pack your models, you look at your two lists, you build, you get a double-sided one of these order token thingies, you build both lists order pools, one on each side, and then you're done. Right? Yeah, that's, that's pretty it. rad. Yeah. So I am I am a huge fan of that. That's uh that's really good. Uh, <laughs> it probably I mean it has to help keep some level of sanity between the two games. Yeah. Um and it's also like helpful for your opponents to to know that you're really keeping track, right? Yes, it's also really easy to see as well, so that helps. That helps a lot. Um, I'm gonna pull up my lists and talk about uh, where did it is. Yeah, what kind of lists do you build for this? Yeah, okay. So let's take a look at this. Um, so here's uh, here's my ta here's one of my two tack lists. So I played I played tack as me wise Kensai. And then I played a mix uh, because it was like an absolutely silly exercise. I gave my, I brought two double tag lists, one Bakuna and one JSA. I left it to my opponent, which one they'd rather play just to make it like less shitty for them having to wait for me. Um, and so one person picked JSA, the other two picked, picked Bakunin. So it's not entirely legal, but I probably won't do that for uh, going into the future. Because I actually have registered a second ITS now and intend to to play it. Um, I, I, my, my, my plan I don't know how sane this is, is to go to tournaments and register twice. And if I if there's an odd number because of me, I'll drop one of my ITS profiles. Um, and then we'll just go from there. Um, sure. But anyway, so this is this is uh, my I like big bases list from, uh, from TAC. <laughs> uh, it has Veronin in it. Uh, and then Veronin is really just there to for his, you know, Strategos order and also to power a front of it, uh, sniper. 
and I put a line Kazakh paramedic in just as a little bit of an insurance policy, and it's not that much more expensive than a regular line Kazakh. So that allows me to like shoot stuff with an AP sniper rifle with MSC1, which is good, period. Um, in there also is Pavel, double dog warrior, double Ermandino. I probably would have preferred, I probably should downgrade the Ermandinos to line Kazakhs, or rather upgrade their Ermandinos to the line Kazakhs by dropping the line Kazakh paramedic down to a regular one, and they'll give you more orders for the dog warriors. But uh, Ermandinos aren't bad. So, I mean, that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, that was a little bit of an oversight on my part, but I was, like, kind of mad about TAC anyway. Not that TAC's bad. Sure. I just was having a hard time building for them. Um, group two is uh, Quad TR Bot. So, TAC can take the, <laughs> cu the, the Courier. I don't, know, I don't know how you say that. But anyway, yeah, so it's just, it's just for Urguns because um, you don't have to think about it, right? That's the other thing. Like, you build this list. There's no thinking <laughs> regarding the, the TR Bots. They shoot stuff. Right, like quad, no, there's no subtlety. Just, just shoot the thing. Um, and yeah. then they're there to power uh, double dynamo uh, FOs, which is I think the the best FO, uh, the best dynamo profile because they just have so much stuff, uh, and they go so fast cool. and they're cheap. Um, nothing wrong with the AP Spitfire, but like this is most of the way there, and you get like all this other toolkit. Again, you know, toolkits are good. Uh, and then a Spetsnaz AP rifle, a parachutist, because that's a rad profile. Uh, I am super, super jazzed about them um yeah so this was sort of uh one combat group runs itself right the the dynamo do stuff and the specialist comes on and shoots things and the other one kind of has like a bunch of random tools um with the with the ap sniper rifle and then pavel so uh that was interesting the other <laughs> so the other reason why this list was constructed the way it was is uh, i was challenged by tony uh, aka zukov 2 to play a list that had at least two dog warriors, um, no burst force swick weapons. Um, and the reason for that is because like if I restricted myself to no burst four at all, uh, then I can't like take front of Vix and tack, which seems silly because they have sure. assault pistols, right? Um, and then uh, no antipode packs. Because he is a little down on dog warriors in vanilla Ariadna specifically versus Cameroonians. Um, and mm. my opinion was that because uh, he, he says, well, Four points cheaper, unassailable, cheaper is cheaper, right? Um, but natural born warrior is a big deal. Um, and that's like the that's his that's his reasoning. Um, my counter and my, my my counter to that is three wounds, right? Which is also yep. unassailable, more wounds better. However, his counter to that is that um, you come in at like what is it, like arm two or something for the for the small guy, right? Sure. And if you take all the wounds on that, you don't you don't get to like M big in and take the wounds on the bigger the no, higher arm. We don't it's not that huge of a difference. It's not that huge of a difference. I think it's like one arm difference. And furthermore, right, if they've got total immunity, uh, like what, what are the, what's the likelihood you take all three wounds in one go? Very low. Yeah. Um, and I will say in every game, it was relevant. Um, they took two or three wounds each, right, in each game. So um, that was, that's, you know, uh, Cameroni would have been dead, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so not, I think, I think, not dead beats dead. Yeah. So, so this was this was me tuning specifically for, um, you know, uh, having one combat group that like just does things by itself. I don't think about it like the dynamos go get objectives if there's a hole made by the first group. If there isn't a hole, I can generate one with the spetsnaz, uh, and then like the tr bots run themselves. I don't have to think about them. If you challenge them, they'll just shoot you and maybe die. If, if they also might kill you, um, and then uh, the other group is where all the subtlety is. Uh, and so that allowed me to sort of like make only half the list that I had to think about, right? So that's sort of one thing that I, I did. Also like this crazy restriction from Tony. So um, I ended up playing Sergeant Rock, aka Jeff, um, and he was playing uh, Sakush, Sakush base list um, with four four links in it. <laughs> so he's got he's got a, a Gulam core with a Zaidin missile launcher just to lock down the board, um, a Shakush Rafiq duo. Um, and then he's got a Yara Haddad, Ruhani, Gulam Hakker, Harris, right, to just go around and do things. And then if that wasn't enough, he's also got Layla and Rafiq. Um, and so the highlight of this game was, like, taking freaking forever to put down the Shakush, and then <laughs> the Spetsnaz decharging Carmen in the face, which was pretty rad. Um, so that was that was list one for, um, for TAC. List two was this one. I call it Template City. Uh, if you look at group two, you immediately see why. 
It's quad Strelok Mind Layer for 12 camo tokens and double Dog Warrior. Um, and the reason I did that is because, yes, it's more camo tokens, but then I don't need to remember which one is which Strelok. I just need to remember which one is a Strelok and which one is a mine, which one is a decoy. So that was easy for me to, to manage and like just thinking about it. Um, and then group one is Veronin because Veronin is good in attack. Uh, Pavel, a scout, Ford Observer, uh, the order generating tractor mule version, an Ermandino, a Spetsnaz, and a tank hunter missile launcher. Um, that tank hunter cleaned house. Uh, it it was crazy. Uh, also, the dog warriors like in I was playing, I was playing. Um, yeah, this was this is also really interesting. So the way I play this list is I use the Sherlock's and dog warriors to like kill as much as I possibly could. And then, mm -hmm. and then I'm like, okay, my turn's over. And then I look over at the other order pool. And I'm like, holy shit, I have like seven orders to do things with. And like, it's powering a scout and Pavel. And I'm like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> I can do so much stuff. <laughs> uh, and so that was like, like, I was always like, it's just a weird thing. Cause you go, you go from like getting your ass kicked by combined. Right. And you come back and you're like, oh, I have seven orders of scout. This is like, it's such a like little pick me up in the middle of the turn. Right. Um, Quad quad stray like mine layers. Yeah, that's, that's it's, so, it was, it's pretty brutal. That's <laughs> Twelve gonna... camo markers right there. Yeah, yeah, and then three from the other group. Um, yeah, it's it's good. I will say that it's easy to pilot this one. Um, that's four. That's four mines in the midfield. Yep. Eight camo markers. Your opponent is like, what the hell do I do with this? Yep. Oh, like the the the. Like the decoys don't do anything, but the real camo markers have a boarding shotgun. Yep. So one interesting thing here that was actually very relevant is you like it. I do end up telegraphing which are mines, but when I mean you end up wanting to put the Sherlock prone, especially if there's like roofs and stuff, right? Sure. Which means the decoy also is supposed to be prone. That actually helps a ton for like cognitive. Oh, is load. the decoy prone? I believe so. I mean, like, okay. Clay can correct me, but I, I think basically the decoy just copies whatever state the, the real thing is, right? So that mm -hmm. is, that's incredibly helpful. Uh, I, I mean, even if you don't have to do it, I did it just to sort of keep myself sane and re help me remember what was what. Um, and so that was really helpful too. The hardest thing about this list is remembering to remove the decoy after the Sherlock pops, right? Um, but yeah, no, this was a, this was a fun, a fun thing. Uh, the dog the warrior. Replicas replicate all state tokens prone, yeah, so, unloaded, yeah. etc. that the decoy user has. Yeah. Huh. Yep. So not crazy. Well, not not crazy for that reason. But anyway. Um yeah. Highlight of this game was uh one dog warrior on turn one, eight, uh a Rindak, a Yaogat, uh the Zai Zabuk. Morat and Slaver thing. I don't know what it's called. Um, uh, a Dadarazi and half of Kornak. <laughs> so, <laughs> very efficient. It died, but hyper efficient nevertheless. Um, okay, so that was my two tack lists. They kind of are reasonably <laughs> I mean, easy. To, I, yeah. what, did you get anything exciting? Any exciting kills with the uh, Total Reaction here again? Uh, no. Not, none of my Uragons killed anything. The only time somebody actually shot at them was Yara killed one, and that was it. Okay. Um, but she was, like, at 24, and, like, she sure. was on the plane table, and, you know, so it was just bad. Um, so let's see. Let's take a look at my, uh, my uh, JSA list. Uh, so this one is actually also really easy to pilot, right? So... Uh, I, I won't do it in order. I'll sort of do the, the, the easy to pilot stuff first. So double where you can HRLs, they just sit there and shoot stuff. No thinking involved. Um, double Oyoroi, also no thinking involved. Just don't deploy them bad and then shoot stuff with them. And they defend right. themselves against most things. They have koalas and they actually can stand up in a close combat fight. Um, so, I mean, they're not going to like stop an Achilles or something, but you know, they will fight most other things just fine. Um, so that actually is quite nice. And then uh, our Gato Harris, including Kuroshi. Um, and that is because the mission lineup, I, I designed this not for the mission lineup. I designed it just to be a double tag list, but it matched very well with the mission lineup because the mission I played this one was uh, Battleground, which is, I think, frontline equivalent. Um, and yeah, 
Uh, basically, the bikes just sat there and did nothing all game until turn three, where they have all the movement in the world to go where they need to go and put points in zones. And then the Oyoroi just kill stuff. Uh, I lost an Oyoroi to Achilles. That's going to happen. Um, yeah. The other one, the other one killed um, Achilles, Akmon, Eudoros, and Phoenix. So, seems pretty good. Uh, I think all in one turn, too. So, that was a pretty brutal turn for my opponent. Um, and then, you, I for, for absolute shits and giggles, I rolled Yojimbo into Achilles on turn one. It did not go well, but it was fun. Brutal. Yeah. I mean, that's a... I like Double Your Eye. I was really surprised how much I enjoyed it at a shit show. Yeah. I, I So... Look at this construction of the list, right? So one of the things is that there's stuff that runs itself, right? There's not a lot of subtlety yeah. to this list. It just it just shoots and stabs stuff. Um, and there's not a lot of decision-making to be made in reactive, which is also very good for playing multiple games at once because you just have less. Like, you're trying to avoid decision fatigue. For me right now, my big challenge is managing decision fatigue in an infinity setting. Um, sure. So, so that's sort of my my, you know hurdle I'm trying to get over at the moment. And um, the other thing is that uh, list degradation is a big deal too, because you will make more mistakes when you're playing more games. Um, mm -hmm. So being in a position where your list is inbuilt redundancy, what do I mean by redundancy? There's obvious redundancy in here that I have two freaking tags, right? One goes down, the other one's still alive. That's six wounds to chew through, big deal. Um, but the other thing that has redundancy is I have movement redundancy and the fact that I have like four bikes, right? And so if I need to be somewhere, it's not that expensive order-wise to do so. And I will be order-starved late in the game because the Ryukin will eventually die to, like, a Phoenix, right? Like, there, it's not a great yeah. time for either of them, but eventually Steel will kill your Ryukin. That will happen. It will happen even faster if Atalanta's on the table. Um, but, yeah, so that's sort, of, that's sort of the reason why this list is constructed the way it is, is because it has actual literal redundancy and also ways to uh, survive Sur uh, surmount um, attrition very well and very efficiently. Sure. Um, the last the last list that I played was this um, this list uh, with double um, double stigmata, and so what you've probably seen online is stigmata plus the orphan engineer with the repeater, which I think is good. I don't think I don't think this I don't have a problem with that. It is very hard to fit along with the other things that I want to fit. So this one, this one is actually significantly harder to pilot um, than the JSA version um, because uh, the support package for the tags is not as robust. Um, okay. So taking the taking the place of the Ryukin is the Sin Eater. So that's uh, I would argue like as close to a one to one replacement as you can get. You lose Mim six, you go to Mim three, but you get marksmanship and and neurocinetics. So very, very good, uh, more expensive. Um, but I mean, I've said this before, uh, Sin Eater Marksmanship Multi Sniper is effectively buying a full five man link so with a Mimetism Multi Sniper for 35 points in one swick, which is a steal. It's so good. It's a steal. It's so good. I mean, like, you lose six cents, fine. I'll, whatever. Fine. <laughs> like, it's okay. Um, marksmanship is actually but subtly super super strong in sixth sense situations like even shooting through smoke right it helps a lot yeah yeah huh. um so what's interesting is you'll note that uh stigmata by themselves uh cost three swick sin eaters end up being another two swick so you're at five swick now right uh my philosophy on tags is assume that before you get a turn your opponent has walked around to your side of the table before either of you have a turn and picked up your tag and thrown it in the trash. That's my attitude towards putting a tag in the list. The rest of your list has to survive as if you paid for but never got to use the tag and your opponent didn't spend any resources to remove it. That's the bar I set for a tag list. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a high bar, but I think that makes your list construction a lot more robust to disruption because I think what you generally see with tag lists is like okay the tag is there it's invincible I don't have to worry about it losing it and then the rest of your list is like Joan uh, Hellet and like a, like a war core and a, like a tech bee right and a bunch of like Bugazi mm -hmm. and like if your tag if your tag power goes down then you're like totally fucked like what do you do like, no, say, then you lose it. yeah like is James is, is Jones gonna run around and like save the day like she can try but it's not gonna happen um, 
So uh, I think I think that's sort of my attitude here. And the problem with this list is that there's two tags, so you can sort of say like, well, um, you can sort of expect half a tag to survive, right? Because it'll be degraded in some way. Maybe you lost a wound. Right. Maybe it gets possessed and kills a bunch of your other stuff or whatever. So you need to be careful there. So the rest of the list has to survive without two tags. Like, what do you do then? Sin eaters are going to go down. So basically what you're saying is when I start my turn, I have no tags and maybe one sin eater left or maybe one tag and no sin eaters, right? That's sort of the situation you're looking at and what's left to carry the game. And so your natural reach would be the Vostok, right? Um, and you're sure. like, oh, um, Vostok's great. It's got MIM-6, it's got a damage 16 Mark 12, and it, most importantly, it's zero SWIC, right? Then I can afford a hacker, which is excellent in Bakunin, right? I mean, like you have two hackers with the tags, but you probably want another one to have more board projection. And so Zoe is an excellent, uh, Zoe and Pyle are excellent additions to this list. And so that seems really good. But then like your other stuff is like moderators. <laughs> and you're like, what are you going to do with moderators? Uh, right. Like when the tags go down, like that, you have like no hitting power after that. So I really, really struggled with this. And I was really, uh, I was really not having a good time trying to pilot this list because, you know, my opponents, uh, Eric, you know, uh, I, I sold the tags at, at dear cost to him, um, but he managed to pull it out. Uh, and then um, my other opponent, uh, was playing Starmada and he had a Zeta on the table and just like blew them off the table, right? Like I, this is, like I, the Sin Eaters actually performed amazingly against the Zeta. The two of them died, but ate an entire ten order turn, right? Of just Zeta shooting at them, getting dropped, getting picked up by a Lambda, shooting some more, finally dropping them both. Um, but then like the tags just didn't survive after that, so that was very tough. I had a bunch of positioning problems, which we'll talk about in the battle re battle report. So, um. This list is actually quite difficult to, to pilot because unlike the other lists where I have a bunch of bikes that can be where they need to be very cheaply, Zoe, Pyle, and a moderator are not moving around the board very quickly and they're actually slowing the Vostok down, right? Mm -hmm. And the Vostok mm -hmm. is, is uh, range 24 and um, I, don't, I don't really like it in Bakunin. Maybe it works better in like vanilla or Tunguska, um, but I'm not a fan in Bakunin because... It just doesn't have the reach that I want it to have. Um, and so oftentimes I find myself in the situation where like I'm on sixes and you're on sixes or you're on like fives and I'm on sixes and we both miss. And that's acceptable because I didn't lose my Vostok in a normal list, right? But in this list, if the tag is down or both tags are down, I'm and maybe one sin eater, I'm at like seven orders now. I probably lost our monitors. I'm at six orders, let's say. And now... If I whiff in my active turn with the Vostok, and I have to try maybe two more times to drop a multi wound model, I've lost the game. Yeah. Right. I can't. I cannot afford to be rolling on sixes, landing one hit, and not dropping you. So my response to this, which I need to try at a game night at some point, is this. So I haven't played this yet, but this is my response to the list. What I don't like. What I don't want to do is come in and be like, okay, I. Uh, I, I'm having trouble with a list. Uh, I'm just going to chuck it and, and just play a different flavor of Bakunin. Uh, I, I need to figure this out. I don't think Vostok's the right answer for me as my play style. So what I decided to do was this instead. So it looks very similar. There are still two moderators in here. There's just a lieutenant and a lieutenant decoy, right? So just nine points. Um, mm -hmm. There's double stigmata, double sin eater, just as before. That's actually what I started the list build with because I wanted to retain that. The reason for that is, like we've said before, sin eater marksmanship, amazing. I don't want to put the Sigmata out to arrow if I can help it, especially when there's a, a Apex Predator like a Zeta on the table, right? So I'm willing to lose the Sin Eater to that. I'm not willing to lose this, uh, the Sigmata to that. Um, and then so my, my backup is actually a, a, much, um, a much higher quality link. So that's a Cyclone Furibach, a Riot Girl Boarding Shotgun, and Fiddler, right? So Fiddler keeps... The Cyclone running, uh, Rat Girl gives me the hacking protection that I need because I don't actually have the capability to hack in that list, in that, in that link rather. Um, and I feel a lot more comfortable about pushing that link around and having it survive in the midfield. Uh, because A, they're faster, they're all six something, right? They're six four or six two. Um, mm -hmm. And they have movement skills to get me where I need to go, right? The Cyclone is climbing plus, Fiddler is super jump. Um, and I have a template that I can risk in front of something like a Caliban or a speculo, right? So like sure. I can I can trade effectively 
um, and and uh, and just and now I have access to drop areas, which I did not before. I lose I lose things like access to Pywall. If I could take Pywall by himself without Zoe, I would all the time, because he's such a toolbox, and it might be worth <laughs> thinking about. As long as the tax. Yeah, it it it's. I mean, she she's very good now. She's 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 changed a lot, I think. Um, and it's almost worth thinking about trying to find a way to fit a Stempler in here because a Stempler does most of what Pywall does. Uh, one of the really important things that uh, this list is weak to is CC. There's no Chimera. There's no Morlocks. So, um, like, uh, Eric tied up one of the Stigmata in close combat with, I think it was like a Gaki or something. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it was, might have been, I think it was a Taiga. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I pop Pyle up, triangulated fire it. Like, that's not going to scratch the paint on the Stigmata. So I just I just blew the Gaki off the Stigmata, I mean, the, the Taiga off the Stigmata and kept on rolling with my turn. Um, so... You know that's that's sort of the thing, and and then Fiddler actually is like not great, but not terrible in close combat. Um, so this this feels a lot stronger to me. It, like people will say, oh, you're losing the you're losing the uh, uh, the Mim Six um, and the two wounds on the Vostok, conceded, right? Like those are big things, but I punch out farther and I hit harder when I when I hit, uh, and I think yeah. that's actually what I want because if I hit if I hit something. It has to drop in one order, and if I'm spending two, it absolutely has to drop on the second order. Like I, I can't afford to like mess around. Yeah, you need you need the stuff to die. It has have, to go. You don't have the orders like yeah. to, to spend several orders killing something. Yeah, and so you know, I was talking to I think it was Frank or maybe it was Lila on Discord, and they were like, "Dude, have you not buffed the Vostok before? That's that's bonkers good. Agreed, very good. Don't have the orders in this list, right?" So I think I think that's sort of a playstyle difference there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I I I'm sort of anti smoke trick, anti buffing, uh, because you could have spent that order just shooting, and you probably would have won the face to face anyway if you're playing the range bands and cover right. Um, and so I would rather spend that one order on positioning to get those benefits, because positioning also gets me closer to objectives. Mm -hmm. So that's sort that's of a. A quick description of what I did at the last tournament. Uh, I ended up going 3-0 with TAC and 1-2 with, with JSA slash Bakunin. I lost both Bakunin games. Uh, one was almost a tie uh, against against Armada. It was literally, we were playing superiority. If Pywall had made one whip roll, it would have been a straight tie, which was a bummer. But, you know, my opponent played very well. Can't fault him for that. Um, yeah. So I, I think, uh, you know, this exposed um, weakness in, in my play, which I was very thankful for when I was playing Eric, for example, um, and also playing Will uh, with Bakunin, because I was playing at a disadvantage. They had both um, done a very good job of removing tools that I needed and playing to the mission. Um, and because I was flustered on the other table, I didn't do that as well. And playing from from a, mm -hmm. from, uh, from being behind was very difficult when you're when you're distracted. Because and this also basically like a uh, learning to trust your instincts. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, and I, I, this is a hundred percent again, right? Like I said before, playing to failure or practicing to failure. Right? Yeah. Like uh, if I practice to failure, I've you know I've built up the 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 you know patterns of play. I, I know what to do, uh, and also. Um, one of the things that I do all the time, like a perfect example is that Zoe thing, like dealing with the Caliban and the, and the Specular, right? I told myself when I started this, I was like, mm, Zoe and Pywell cannot do this. They don't have the odds in their favor. They're not going to be able to do it. I have to solve this problem another way. And unfortunately, there is no other way for me to solve the problem. So then it becomes a make or break game loss or game win tipping point. If I don't mm -hmm. commit, when I have the resources to accomplish it, I will lose the game. And that's exactly what happened, right? I didn't commit. I committed to something else that was very strong because what Eric, Eric had made a critical mistake, which was putting a Taiga next to the Anathematics camo token. And the Anathematic was his yeah. lieutenant. And it was close enough to bounce an HRL template off of. So I drove a Stigmata all the way across the table, burned an Overdrawn off the table, and got, I think, two shots on the... Um, on the anathematic once 
killing the taiga and once directly against it, right? Because I could still see it after the taiga blew up, and sure. it was obviously out of camo then. Um, and it was in NWI at that point because I, I had really nailed it on the taiga, but it passed all the saves, and then my opportunity was gone. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, that was a much higher variance play, I think, than than you know coming in and and doing the discover on a twelve and then on an eleven. Sorry, an eighteen with Zoe. Uh, and then just like throwing templates at the specular, because once the specular re- is revealed, you know it's a, it's a pushover in shooting. You just whap it with sure. something like Pywell. I I had a Vostok there. The Vostok would have eaten it, right? No problem. Um, so and then it's a matter of dealing with the uh, with the Caliban, but that's easy because Pywell's there. Censor that sucker and then shoot it with something, and you're done. So would you say that uh, playing the two games at once? Um... Maybe not in a competitive setting, but I think what do you think for players that are that are feeling plateaued, right where they are? Maybe as a way to create an artificial, because like, that's basically what you're doing, right? Is you're creating an yeah. artificial set of stressors. Yes, exactly. Um, um, so that's an interesting question. I think uh, like it depends you what you're having trouble with. like every twenty minutes and send you passive aggressive text messages while you're playing a game. That also might. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Also, also possible. But I, but that's actually a really good question. Um, as a tool for improving your game across multiple, you know, multiple game systems, the double play, the playing multiple games at the same time, uh, directly, um, directly targets the problem of how you perform under increased cognitive load, right? Okay. Um, and so that's why it's relevant to me right now in my development as an Infinity player. I need additional cognitive load to expose myself to those failure opportunities more frequently. It's not to say that when I'm playing one-on-one, sure. I don't make mistakes. I absolutely do. My opponent can throw me for a loop. I can get mentally or emotionally agitated and make, you know, and like fall a line of play that's bad and some optimal. I won't realize that until I write, write the battle report weeks later, right? Uh, so for me, I need that increased cognitive load to improve. That's what I need. Talking to somebody like, I don't know, Owen, who goes by Savnock on the forums, right? So his problem we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago uh, when I played him. He w- felt like he was under artificial time pressure when we had plenty of time left in the round. And so he made knowing suboptimal choices because he felt like he was slowing the game down. He felt bad. And he wanted to make sure that we completed the game on time. And he felt like a lot of social pressure and anxiety, which I was not giving, right? Like maybe if I was unconsciously, you know, mea culpa, I apologize, but you know, it, I was just sort of like, you know, take all the time you need, do what you need to do. We got plenty of time. And so but he just kept like getting in his own head and being like, I felt like he was under time pressure. So um, what we discussed afterwards was like, you should play on a clock, not to increase the time pressure, but so you can visually see the clock and be like, holy shit, I've got 45 minutes left. And we're at the, like the you right. know, top of two and we're fine. Right. So he can then give himself the permission to be like, I'm good. Like I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And then so other like, but then really it boils down to like, what do you think your most problematic pro- problematic aspect of your play is? So for like, so let's take a look at a newer player. For a newer player, do not do this, right? I, I, I there's, there's just there's just too much cognitive load. There's too much. You need to remember too many things. You need to like mentally chunk and categorize too many things, which you probably haven't done yet. Which isn't to say you're bad, or or you know, it's it's not a question of your competence or anything. It's just a question of your experience. You just have less time with the game, right? I've been playing mm-hmm. this game for over a decade now. So um, so, so what I would suggest to somebody like that, like a newer player who's having problems with, like, I don't know, like say deployment, right? Going back to a conversation we had on Discord, deploy. That, that can be your thing, yeah. right? Set yourself a hard deployment limit and, and stick to it, right? Like if you, if you give yourself 15 minutes of deployment, then whatever you don't deploy is dead, right? Well, it's interesting, you know, because like deployment is such an important part of the game, yep. but deploying poorly isn't the end of the world and even if you had all the reason to not deploy, like if you just if you went faster and you didn't deploy great right like yeah. it makes it it makes it quicker for you to recognize bad patterns in deployment in the future right and it also um it creates an art basically bad deployment is artificially giving your opponent good deployment sure right 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 so, so it's what do I do if my opponent did deploy very well mm-hmm. and they're able to take advantage of my lines? So here's here's what I suggest. If you've deployed badly, you will find out by the end of your opponent's first turn. Yeah. That seems reasonable. Uh, so what I suggest to you is, you know, do what I do what I said, which is 
pick some arbitrary time limit, whatever you feel comfortable with. Whatever you don't deploy, either it gets deployed by your opponent or, you know, it's just dead off the table. Play the first turn, stop, and then spend the rest of the time you would spend playing the rest of the game, which is already a foregone conclusion probably at that point, right? You may have just gotten yeah. almost tabled or alpha striked hor horribly bad or all your specialists are dead and a button pushing mission, right? Like y this is more or less an uncover unrecoverable position. So why are you going putting yourself through it? Stop, discuss with your opponent, talk about what you could have done better. And then if you have time, maybe re-rack, redeploy, play the first turn again, feel the difference, and then tell yourself what you did right. Right. So one of the things is sure. that there's like a one to one to four ratio or one to five ratio of good to bad memories. So for every every um, every uh, like every one bad memory is uh, it requires like four or five good memories to to stick like you to override. Right. So mm. that means you need to set up opportunities for yourself to succeed and remember how and why you succeeded. Right. And so so compress the game, right? Get rid of the stuff that doesn't yeah. matter. Like if you have a shitty deployment and you're basically dead at the end of turn one, don't play turns two and three, play turn one and the deployment again, right? And if you're like, don't, obviously you can't do that at a tournament, that's, but at game that's night, the practice you need. that's the practice you need, right? So, so really, really what this crazy double game thing is, 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 is really advocating for is identify the thing that you're having problem with, uh, having a problem with in whatever game you know, you're playing or even in life, right? And then finding some way to put yourself in a relatively safe, low stake situation. Like if I lose a, a well, my internet points go down. Eh, it's fine, right? Um, and then stress yourself to the point of failure in a training scenario. So when it does come up and you need to perform at peak capacity, you've been exposed to that failure, right? And so it, just just find the thing that you need to improve on, and then develop a tool for yourself to to really hone in on that one particular problem area, and then execute on. Well, right on. There we have it. Well, you've wasted another perfectly good evening listening to Late Night War Games. John, let's take it away. All right. So if you want to get in touch with us, you can do so at mailbag at latenightwargames.com. You can talk to us uh, about any questions you have, comments. Uh, if you have any ideas for us to try out, that's also cool. Uh, please let us know. We'd love to hear from everybody. Uh, the easiest way to get in touch with us is either via that email address or via our Discord, which you can find at latenightwargames.com. There's a link there to join. Um, you can also find our painting and uh, Infinity gameplay prompts at bromanacademy.com. Uh, we're here every first and third Tuesday of the month on Twitch at 8.30 p.m. Pacific. It's a weird time. We know this. Yeah. Uh, thank you to all of you who can join us at this time. If you can't, we upload uh, the video to YouTube on the following day, uh, and we upload the audio to your favorite podcast app uh, also on the following day. Uh, if you like what you do, what we do and you want to support us, you can either do so via the normal things on YouTube and Twitch. Subscribing in both scenarios helps us a lot uh, in terms of visibility and, of course, uh, covering some of our expenses. Uh, and you can also do so more directly via uh, Patreon and become a late-night wargamer, which gives you uh, any one of those options gives you, um, I suppose specifically the Twitch subscription and the Late Night Wargamer Patreon subscription give you access to our secret Discord areas where we talk about other things. Um, and then, of course, thank you to our our uh, sponsors, DreamPod9, Chiv Games, Corpus Melee, Board of Brew, and Brutal Cities. All right, yeah, be sure to catch us on Facebook, YouTube, and anywhere that you get your podcasts. If you enjoy the show, please take a moment to give us a five-star rating on iTunes and follow us on Twitch and YouTube. Uh, all of this helps us bring you the best content that we possibly can. All right, and with that, stay safe out there. Take care, and we'll see you on the next Tuesday. We do this thing. Good night, everybody. Uh, 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 uh. Won't you play games with me? And I like to do everyone. That's what I like to do. That's what I like to do. That's what I really like to do, that's what I really like to do.